It was a show that made TV history. B-A-T-M-A-N. And turned camp into cool. To me, it was so enormously fresh and funny, I couldn't resist it. It exploded onto the pop culture scene and transformed the dynamic duo of Adam West and Burt Ward into superstars overnight. If I had a paper cup or something, I'd set it down. Uh, people would almost get into a fist fight trying to get that cup as a souvenir. Its heroes stood for what was right. Watch it, chump. The dust are in safety. Oh, sure. And fought tirelessly against evil. It was brilliantly written, brilliantly cast. It was pearl. But on-set tensions sometimes plagued its caped co-stars. Behind our masks were perfectly ordinary people. And typecasting nearly ruined their careers. Do you recognize me? Those guys looked at you like, uh, oh no, well you're typecast. After filming Batman, that's all you can do. But what's the real story behind Batman's extraordinary roller coaster ride? Stay tuned. This is the Bat Time. This is the Bat Channel. Since his creation in 1939 by artist and writer Bob Kane, the shadowy superhero Batman had been a fixture in comic books and movie serials. The alter ego of millionaire Bruce Wayne, Batman, with the help of his trusty sidekick Robin, kept the streets of Gotham City safe, fighting crime as a serious and righteous avenger. But in the mid-1960s, he would take on a whole new attitude. At that time, Television networks CBS and NBC were dominating the ratings with family-oriented shows like The Munsters, Lost in Space, and Daniel Boone. In an effort to compete with its more successful rivals, struggling ABC approached 20th Century Fox and veteran producer William Dozier with a plan to create a series based on the Caped Crusader. I bought a dozen of the comic books of various vintages. So I read all these things. And I thought, they must be out of their minds. You know, it was all so juvenile. And, and so then a very simple idea struck me, and that was to overdo it. And if you overdid it, I thought, it would be funny to adults. And yet it would be stimulating the kids, the daring do. And, but you had to appeal on both levels or you didn't have a chance. Dozier then developed the pilot script with television writer Lorenzo Semple Jr. and began looking for actors, particularly those with a background in drama who also had natural comic timing. It was a tough search because uh, you've got to find an actor uh, who is prepared to play Alice in Wonderland as though it were Hamlet. An agent came in and he showed me an eight by 10 of a guy with a surfboard. He said, what do you think of this fellow? I said, who is he? He said, his name's Adam West. Actor Adam West had been working steadily in Hollywood for six years, appearing in numerous television shows and feature films, mostly dramas and westerns. His only real stab at comedy had been opposite the Three Stooges in The Outlaws Is Coming. In 1960, he had captured a recurring role on the hit TV series, The Detectives, starring Robert Taylor. But none of these parts tapped into his most remarkable quality, his gift for quirky, deadpan humor. In 1965, however, it was that comic flair, which he used to send up the current James Bond craze, that impressed William Dozier. I see automation displaces labor in your organization too, Dr. Sloan. Ah, oh, Captain Q. Join me in a glass of delicious chocolate quick, won't you? Thank you, Doctor. I could use some energy. Incidentally, one of those torpedoes you fired at me was circling and... You're sunk. Toodaloo! Kip, thank you! Some people will do anything to get rich, quick. Toodaloo. Initially, however, Adam had serious doubts about playing a cartoon-based character. My agent called and said, they want to see at Fox about doing Batman. I said, you're kidding. I'm trying to have a serious career here. You know, get off my phone. And 
He said, no, they, I think they've got some uh, different ideas. I said, okay, I'll go see him. In the meantime, Charles Fitzsimons continued interviewing younger actors, hoping to find the other half of the dynamic duo, Robin. We were looking for a young kid, and my assistant, Charlie Fitzsimons, came into me one day, and he said, I think we may have found our boy. Burton Jervis was a wannabe actor and college student who was selling real estate on weekends to help pay the bills. Got an exhibition. What are you going to do now? Well, I'm going to do a couple of throws and a couple of falls. Falls? You're going to take the falls yourself? Right, I'm going to throw the, I'll do the falls first, and then I'm going to take the throws. All right, and let's throw. see a couple of falls. Burt was only 20 years old when he tried out for the role of Robin and Robin's earnest alter ego, Dick Grayson. Ah. It was his first audition as a professional. So I met Mr. Dozier, and he says, you look just right, but the only problem is you're kind of big. I said, oh, sir, I promise you, I won't grow anymore. And he laughed, and uh, he says, I like that. Dozier loved Bert's combination of enthusiasm, sincerity, and all-American good looks, and thought he would fit perfectly with Adam's straight-faced approach to Batman. Look, between the lines, when is the time of a clock like the whistle of a train. When it's two to two. Two, two, two. Right you are. Holy caboose! But the network insisted on seeing a second pair of actors. So the producers filmed one screen test with Adam and Bert and another with Lyle Wagner and Peter Dayell. Look, between the lines, when is the time of a clock like the whistle of a train? When it's Two to two. Two, two, two. Right you are. Holy caboose. Here's another one. What has neither flesh, bone, nor nail, yet has four fingers and a thumb? A glove. Roger. Two, two, two. A glove. It's an address. It must be an address. I get it. 222 Glover Avenue. You've done it, chum. You've done it, chum. After viewing both screen tests, ABC agreed to sign Adam West and Burton Jervis. But Bert decided that people wouldn't know how to pronounce his last name, so he changed it to Ward. With the dynamic duo in place, William Dozier quickly cast the supporting roles with veteran actors. Neil Hamilton as the concerned Commissioner Gordon. Stafford Rep as the Commissioner's right-hand man, Chief O'Hara, Alan Napier as the loyal butler, Alfred, and Madge Blake as Bruce Wayne's doting Aunt Harriet. Dozier then turned his attention to the show's style. He decided to shoot in color, still relatively new to television. The use of vibrant colors in the costumes, in the sets, uh, I'm sure no one had touched anything like that before because you had these incredible reds and greens. Even Batman had the bright blues and yellows. These were colors you would see ordinarily in a comic book, but I doubt anyone had translated them so literally to the TV screen before. Dozier also planned to include many fun gadgets and props and hired world-renowned car customizer George Barris to design and build a distinctive, definitive vehicle, the Batmobile. In 65, I was contacted by Dozier. We're doing Batman. We gotta have a Batmobile. But we don't want it to look like Bob Kane's 1937 Lincoln Zephyr with a cutout bat face on the front. We want something a little bit more modern. What can you do for us? I says, great, let me give you some ideas and some sketches. The real car was a concept Lincoln Futura. I took this steel body and we reformed this dual cockpit car for Adam and Bert. I wanted to incorporate the bat features into the automobile. That means that the bat was part of the car. Uh, the top of the fenders where the headlights were were the ears. The mouth was the grill. The nose was coming off the hood and it had a chain slicer that come out. It was quite exciting. We got kind of a big thrill out of it. But Dozier and his writers knew that however stylish and hip they made it, the success of Batman rested entirely on the audience getting its unique brand of humor. In the summer of 1965, they set out to capture that humor on film in the show's pilot episode. There was one line in the pilot that was put in deliberately to set the tone of the humor. And that was when Batman walked into a nightclub in that ridiculous outfit. Please, it's Batman! 
And the maitre d' came up and said, Big side table, Batman. Uh, just looking, thanks. I'll stand at the bar. I shouldn't wish to attract attention. That was the key for the humor in the show. That offbeat humor, joking against the characters. Stand clear. Unfortunately, the first test screenings held by the network to measure audience interest were disastrous. It was the lowest rating they had ever had on anything. Now, had they not already bought the show, ABC, it would never have gone on the air. But ABC's lineup of shows in the fall of 1965 was failing miserably. So executives decided to debut Batman in the coming January as part of the network's so-called second season. They even concocted a huge media blitz to promote the premiere. The pilot episode would introduce audiences to the fictional metropolis of Gotham City and its costumed crime fighters, Batman and Robin. Batman speaking. <laughs> it would also highlight the maniacal exploits of one of the dynamic duo's arch enemies, the Riddler, played by well-known impressionist and character actor, Frank Gorshin. I loved the, the whole thing, I loved the role, loved the idea of playing that role, and enjoyed doing it. Hold it, Riddler. Kids ask me if I still have my green tights. The game's up, Riddler. Snap on the bat cuffs. You've got me, Batman. The show would also tantalize viewers by airing two nights a week, with the first night featuring a cliffhanger ending patterned after the old Saturday matinee serials. It wasn't planned for two nights originally, because we shot them as one-hour shows. And then it was decided to break them up into two half-hours for exhibition, two nights in a week. To make the new structure work, William Dozier needed a narrator. But nobody he auditioned seemed quite right, so he handled the job himself. Will Robin escape? Can Batman find him in time? Is this the ghastly end of our dynamic duo? Answers tomorrow night, same time, same channel. With the premiere of Batman just one day away, anticipation had built to a fever pitch. ABC was looking for a miracle, while Adam West and Burt Ward were just hoping for a hit. But no one was prepared for the frenzy to come. January 12, 1966, Batman made its debut on the ABC television network. And that night, a huge audience tuned in to see the campy adventures of the dynamic duo. The show was an instant and overwhelming success. Atomic batteries to power. Turbines to speed. Batman broke uh, hot. Uh, it broke very big. And naturally, that's a wonderful thing to be part of. It had a 52 share of the audience, which is unheard of. There was no question about it. It was the biggest immediate hit that had ever hit television. In 1966, America was in the midst of powerful social and political change. With the civil rights movement and the Vietnam War grabbing headlines every day, the timing seemed perfect for a show that would comically tip its hat to a simpler era when conflict could be easily defined in terms of good versus evil. One good thing did come of it, Robin. We now know who our adversary is. In Batman, evil came in the fantastic form of a series of recurring villains. Producer William Dozier called in favors to convince his famous actor friends to take the roles. Along with Frank Gorshin as the Riddler, he asked veteran stage and film actor Burgess Meredith to play the Penguin. Burgess Meredith was marvelous because of the cigarette in my face all the time and he didn't smoke. He picked up the laugh uh, because he started to cough, smoking, so it was <laughs> Batman. <laughs> Dozier also chose one of the screen's most popular Latin lovers, Cesar Romero, to play the Joker. Once you get into a costume and you get the makeup on and the wig and you know, then you, you, you change completely. I mean, you just fall right into it. And it was actually a very easy character to play. 
just whooped it on and laugh and scream and, uh, uh, you know, it was just a, a, a ball to do. <laughs> the joker out which Pac-Man and steals the fabulous jewel collection right out from under his nose. <laughs> in addition, Dozier brought in acclaimed Broadway star Julie Newmar, who became the Catwoman. The Catwoman is not like the others. I'll show you how to clip Batman and Robin's wings. I will prevail. Cats are sleek. Cats are fast. Cats are... Well, they're not mean. They're just wily and they grab your attention in the most seductive way. Perfect. You're learning. Other guest villains that season included Roddy McDowell as the bookworm. Do not ask for whom this spell tolls. It tolls for thee. And Victor Buono as King Tut. Failure. Abject failure. I think that Victor Buono was a genius. I loved him. I loved what I wrote. I would write him the most obscure Egyptian references, and he would just make them work. Yes, yes, and praise me, too, for the first time since the golden age of Ramses Jr. that exists the elixir of Abu Rabu Simbu, too. Throughout its first season, Batman stayed at the top of the ratings charts, and the series writers kept the jokes coming. Gosh, Batman, if we could just puzzle out how funny money is handed out by a bank. Good thinking, Robin. Time for us to go fishing, if you ask me. Fishing? But where, Batman? Where the fishing is always best, Commissioner. From a shady bank. The tone of the thing was set by Lorenzo Semple, who wrote the pilot. And then those of us who came afterwards, we just made it crazier. Holy hammer, I'll be cut to pieces by these blades. We had more and more fun and got more bizarre, and and, uh, and they let us get away with it. I mean, the villains we fought against were never doing minor crimes. They always had major crimes. Uh, I remember one time Commissioner Gordon uh, asked Batman what he thought the objective uh, of the villains were in this particular case, and he said, their minimum objective must be the entire world. Along with the success of the show came requests for personal appearances, which Adam and Bert were happy to make. Adam was so proud of being Batman. He was in such demand. He was always going off someplace to appear in big uh, arenas and football uh, uh, coliseums and everything, coming out in his Batman outfit and all that, and uh, he loved every minute of it. I was making a personal appearance in some small town and I had to do my own laundry and so I, I went over and I dropped it in the washer and I came back and put it in the dryer and an hour later I came back and my clothes were all wet and I said, geez, I don't understand. And a little boy rode up on a bicycle and said, oh, well, the lady down the road there uh, came over and, and heard that you were here and took your clothes out of the dryer and put them on top so she could take a picture as a souvenir. Another star performer in Batman was the Batmobile. Fans of the show, as well as automotive enthusiasts, fell in love with its unique design, flashy style, and cool bat features. The car was so popular, we would take it to shows, and thousands of people would come to the shows to come and want to see that Batmobile. They did it auto shows. Adam would get $10,000 and Bert five every time they did this while the show was hot. And they enjoyed it, of course. Why not? It was good for the show. As season one came to an end, Adam and Bert were the two most famous faces on TV. Throngs of men, women, and children followed their every move, and merchandisers were lining up for their services. Everything was bat this, bat that. Let's go and have a bat lunch. Two bat burgers, medium rare. The biggest craze was bat merchandising. There were more Batman gadgets, you know, than you could shake a stick at. And lunch boxes, cups, goblets. In the first year, 1966, there was $75 million worth of merchandise created and sold. I mean, anything you could think of, they had something with a Batman logo on it. And the 
they were amazed that it was outselling all the Bond merchandise, which up to that point had become the big seller. Adam West and Burt Ward had become pop culture icons. Batmania had swept across America and the entire world. I was watching The Batman on television, and that gave me the idea. And although even bigger things were to come for the caped crusaders, there was trouble brewing in Gotham City. This one is bigger than the lot of us. Commissioner, we need help. Emergency. Batman speaking. Warning all of you to brace yourselves for big news. The biggest. In the spring of 1966, 20th Century Fox executives were anxious to capitalize on the success of Batman. They offered Adam West and Burt Ward lucrative contracts to appear in a big screen version of the show. Batman the movie pitted the dynamic duo against four times the usual dose of evil as the Joker, the Riddler, the Penguin, and the Catwoman united to threaten Gotham City. But original Catwoman Julie Newmar had a previous film commitment, so the role of Batman's beautiful feline adversary went to former Miss America Lee Merriweather. You're going to see the perfect crime when I get Batman in my claws. <laughs> Holy glowbot! What's going on? Released in August of 1966, the film followed the successful blueprint of the TV series. Attracting a large audience with its broad, campy humor. In the motion picture, they are trying to get rid of a bomb. Four or five times, they try to get rid of it. And he stopped and says, Some days you just can't get rid of a bomb. That was a tough role to play, you know, because you had to be careful. It could have been just out and out ridiculous. And uh, it was great. As the second season began, however, Issues which had been bubbling under the surface during the first year began to boil over. The show's producers struggled to tighten the reins on escalating production costs, while its stars struggled with problems of their own. Both Adam and I had problems with our costumes. I mean, from tights with runs in them, to wrinkles in the ankles and knees, to uh, extreme bulges in the uh, shorts area. The Catholic Legion of Decency really got on ABC Network about the way I fit in my costume. Uh, the main problem uh, as far as appearance was the to a cowl in that uh, I needed a towel. It was so damn hot. On screen, Batman and Robin were united against evil. But off screen, tensions between West and Ward had been simmering for months. We were completely opposite. Adam had been in many shows, tremendous background, terrific actor, but very Mr. Hollywood. I mean, he wanted his tea at four o'clock in the afternoon. And me, I'm just like this kid that doesn't care having a good time. With little acting experience, Burt was unprepared for his sudden celebrity, and many in the cast and crew felt that he let it go to his head. Burt once came up to me and said, Stanley, you're not writing me enough, you know? You're writing too much for, uh, for Adam. So in the next show, I wrote Burt an enormous part. And he came to me and he said, Stanley, I worked too hard on that show. You gave me too much. Well, now I got a little annoyed. So in the next show, I had Bert kidnapped on about page six. And then I had him uh, found on about page 51. So after that show, he came up to me and he said, I'm never going to say another word to you again. One day I had to had pelt Robin with several eggs. And the camera crew came up to me and said, not two, a dozen. And I said, why, don't you like Bert? And they said, we like Bert, all right, but Bert likes himself more than we like him. So give him a dozen eggs. And it finally ended up, I pelted him with two dozen rotten eggs. Ah! It was really fun. Batman was the first thing that Bert ever did. Naturally, Bert had a lot of insecurities, which made him a pain in the beep, but many times, but 
there were so many times that you understood it. You understood why. You have the patience for it. And Bert grew, he developed, he mellowed. But despite the occasional problems on the set, Batman still ruled the airwaves. And for producer William Dozier, it was especially satisfying to see the reaction from the Hollywood establishment. Many top performers continued to join the show's all-star roster of evildoers throughout its second season. We went a long way from the comic book, but uh, I think we were honest with the characters. We invented a few. We would tailor them to fit the personality that we were getting for the show. Batman became such a popular, tremendously popular show, that it became a thing to be a villain in, in Batman, and everybody was anxious to do it. It's natural to be a little nervous, darling. Everyone is the first time. But not every guest star played a villain. Some actors appeared in cameo roles as themselves. Hey, Batman and Robin, what are you guys doing? While others turned up as their own characters from different ABC shows. Oh, it's you, Batman. Yes, citizen, you may return to your harpsichord. We're on official business. Uh -huh. The network didn't miss an opportunity for a little cross-promotion, and even used Batman to help launch another William Dozier-produced superhero series, The Green Hornet, starring Van Williams and Bruce Lee. What are you doing here? I might ask you the same question. Pursuing the enemies of law and order wherever they happen to be. Well, I don't want to hold you up from your crime fighting. Thank you, and good luck to you, Mr. Hornet. Nice to have met you. Gosh, Batman, what are they dressed like that for? I had the best opportunities there because uh, the very few people in the history of Hollywood have done that much film with that many big names in the same scenes with them. Adam also loved finding the humor in Batman's absurd approach to civic and moral responsibility. Better put five cents in the meter. No policeman's going to give the Batmobile a ticket. No matter, Robin. This money goes toward building better roads. We all must do our part. Good citizenship, you know. Holy taxation. You're right again, Batman. To keep the show edgy, the writers pushed the envelope, especially when it came to the sexual chemistry between Batman and Catwoman. I thought that the underlying tension between Catwoman and Batman, I mean, that they really were drawn to each other sexually. When Batman says behind that cowl, he's a pretty serious cat, right? He, say, he has to say something about dating when you get out of jail. Batman, when I get out of jail, will you take me on a date? We'll have plenty of time to think about that, Catwoman. Several years, I'm afraid. If I were to kiss you, would you think I was a bad girl? Kissing is one of the most natural things in the world. Uh, some people kiss almost every day, and I'm told. Well, we were having fun being bad, and everybody loves to have fun being bad, as long as they can get away with it. Catwoman, I'll do everything I can to rehabilitate you. Marry me. Everything except that. A wife, no matter how beauteous or affectionate, would severely impair my crime fighting. But I can help you in your work. As a former criminal, I'd be invaluable. What about Robin? Robin? Oh, I've got it. We'll kill him. When he wasn't battling dastardly criminals, Adam West enjoyed going out on the town and was often seen in the company of Hollywood's most beautiful leading ladies. But he took his Batman celebrity very seriously, especially when it came to keeping up the Caped Crusader's image in the eyes of his youngest fans. We had kids on the set all the time, and Adam was wonderful with the kids. He would visit with them between setups and let him come and sit on his knee and so on and so forth, and the kids had a ball. But despite Batman's recognition and the fame it had brought to its two stars, cracks began to appear in the Bat armor. 
Gotham City was about to come under attack by a villain that not even the dynamic duo could defeat. Surprise, Batman! Quick, Robin, go behind the bat shield. Surprise and good night! As Batman's second season was coming to an end, ratings were beginning to dip. Playing on back-to-back -back nights was creating overexposure. In response, ABC cut the show down to once a week for its third year. We hit so big and the ratings were so outstanding, there was no way to go but down the scale. In an attempt to keep the series successful, the producers of Batman decided to add a new cast member, bringing in actress Yvonne Craig to play the third Gotham City crime fighter, Batgirl. Batgirl came in in the third year, as I recall, to try to breathe new life into the show, give it an extra new Philip that would hopefully help. For Adam West and Burt Ward, however, the introduction of Batgirl seemed a desperate move. When somebody's added, like a co-star, uh, it's in the nature of the beast, the actor, to say, why? Why do you need somebody else? Aren't I wonderful enough? <laughs> but, you know, you, you you get a little insecure. Like Adam, Batman's writers found it difficult to include a third leading character in the mix, especially with the show's airtime reduced. In addition, Julie Newmar was once again unavailable. So the producers hired the sleek and sultry actress, Eartha Kitt, to wear the cat suit. She may be evil, but she is attractive. You'll know more about that in a couple of years. Now, are you coming quietly, Catwoman, or must we use force? Your silver-tongued oratorial has convinced me, Batman. I hereby remit myself to your muscular custody. Don't try to pull the wool over our eye slits. Now, would I do a thing like that? <laughs> but the new changes failed to halt the decline of the show's ratings. As a result, the network started to cut Batman's production budgets it became increasingly difficult to maintain the high standard the producers had set for themselves to make the humor work. What is the world coming to? We can't stop to worry about that now. It was really no time for us to play with the characters and play with the scene and create the kind of excitement and spontaneous uh, craziness that made our show successful. So I, I would say that it was the financial reasons that really restrained our creativity, which ultimately reduced our ratings. The biggest problem is we had a half hour show and we had essentially about 12 characters in a half hour. By the time you get around giving people lines, you barely have time for a plot. You couldn't do the elaborate stunts. And of course, there was no uh, pickle in the middle. I mean, you couldn't put them into jeopardy. It was a very expensive show to do. The sets were expensive. The special effects were expensive. The cost was killing us. An example of how they were cutting costs, there's an episode with Dr. Cassandra, played by Ida Lupino, and Howard Duff is playing her, uh, her associate, her real-life husband. And they have developed this way to turn the, all the criminals of Gotham City invisible, and they're going to unleash this wave of terror. And in order to, to fight fire with fire, in essence, Batman decides to turn the lights out so that no one can see each other, and it's going to be a fair fight. In reality, they didn't have the budget to shoot the fight sequence with all these different criminals and all these different scenes, so they just shot blackness with the sound effects and the, the words superimposed over the scene. But uh, that's part of the, the charm of the show, is that they, they got away with a lot of that stuff. But no amount of penny-pinching could save Batman. In 1968, Adam and Bert were stunned and deeply disappointed to learn that the show would not return for a fourth season. Batman and Robin to die? Is this really the end? Unbelievable! It was the network decision to cancel the series because it wasn't delivering a big enough audience of the right kind wasn't delivering enough adults who buy things. Yes, it is serious, perhaps far more serious than any of us yet realize. And on March 14, 1968, less than three years after its premiere, Batman aired its final episode in primetime. Yeah.
Yes, I'm looking forward to Minerva's famous eggplant jelly vitamin scalp massage. Minerva thought you might pop them into the persimmon pressurizer first. Persimmon pressurizer? Holy astringent plum like fruit! Only astringent until ripe, Robin. I think you'll find the experience most palatable this way, gentlemen. It seemed that Gotham City and the world had been saved for the last time by the dynamic duo. For Adam West and Burt Ward, however, there would be another, more difficult battle to fight. Batman, what eats crow, yells uncle, and tosses sponges? A loser, and I'm not a loser, Riddler. After its cancellation in 1968, Batman continued to play off and on in syndication, maintaining a loyal following. But as the years went on, the show started to lose its status as a pop culture phenomenon, and it seemed that audiences were laughing at the caped crusaders rather than with them. What is it, Batman? <laughs> Whatever it is, it's, it's awfully funny. <laughs> at the same time, Adam West and Burt Ward realized that they had become prisoners of their own success. Here comes the tragic part, folks. The downside in a race that you're winning is, of course, when it's all over, you, you say, hey, what happened? I'm still here. Where's everybody else? Because you're charged up and you're ready to go on. It becomes uh, somewhat tough after because you try to go on and you try to play other roles. And uh, those guys looked at you like, what? No, Adam. Put him in bed with Faye Dunaway in this... Oh, no, they wouldn't believe that. His cape might show. In 1978, Adam and Bert put their tights back on for a two-part superhero reunion special on the NBC network. But the results were disappointing, and both stars found it harder and harder to separate themselves from their bat image. How do you like my costume? It is neat. Ironically, however, it was that very image that would help catapult them back onto center stage. In the late 1980s, Batman returned to the public eye as moviegoers around the world awaited a new big-budget feature that would star Michael Keaton. The hype surrounding the upcoming film brought the original series back into the public eye. Here are the stars of that show, The Caped Crusaders, Adam West and Burt Ward. In 1988, Adam, Burt, and the rest of the cast were reunited for a 20th anniversary celebration on Fox Television's The Late Show. Does this, uh, uh, this kind of response surprise you 22 years later, or is this... Uh... Holy adulation. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Ross, Ross, that's the wonderful thing about uh, being a part of this uh, thing called Batman. People always have uh, a wonderful warmth and rapport wherever we go in the world. Yeah, it seems yeah, that way. Uh, I guess we've just been around that long. I don't know. <laughs> the following year, the new Batman movie hit theaters across America, smashing box office records and making the dynamic duo hip once again. <laughs> Gotham City, it's TV's classic Batman. In response, Fox put the original Batman back into syndication and gathered many of the show's stars in Hollywood for promotional oh. spots and public appearances. Julie Newmar, how are you, my old arch nemesis? Perfect. In 120 episodes, you said holy exactly 370 times. Holy, holy! Make that 372. Tune in again for the further adventures of Batman. Oh, Bert, you want to drive? Gosh, thanks, Adam. After two decades of typecasting and little meaningful work, Adam West and Burt Ward were thrilled to see the doors of Hollywood begin to open again. Make batteries to power. Turbines to speed. And although both actors moved on to other roles, they acknowledged that they would always be recognized as Batman and Robin. Adam even poked fun at his own bad image with a guest spot on the popular TV show, The Simpsons, a series created by one of his childhood fans, Matt Groening. I have all the people we've had on the show, 
We've had a lot. Adam West really got all these guys <laughs> to come out of their writer's offices and actually sit there and go, oh my God, it's Batman. <laughs> oh, I guess you're only familiar with the new Batman movies. Michelle Pfeiffer. <laughs> the only true Catwoman is Julie Newmar, Lee Merriweather, or Eartha Kitt. And I didn't need molded plastic to improve my physique. Pure West. And how come Batman doesn't dance anymore? Remember the bat to see? <clears throat> Yo, hey, yeah, yeah. <sighs> I know what. Throughout the 1990s, Batman's popularity remained as high as ever all over the world. In 1999, a bat convention in Argentina drew 25,000 fans over a three-day weekend. The bomb detector of the Batmobile. It's flashing red. Quick, hit the radio control ejector button. Decades after it exploded onto the scene, Batman still packs a punch with audiences young and old with its unique blend of wacky humor and childlike adventure. When's a donkey spelled with one letter? When it's you! Batman has remained a part of our culture. Sounds! What sounds? People see it as they grow up. And their kids then watch Batman with them, and they enjoy it. It's something they can do together. To this day, anything that is quintessential Batman, like the utility belt replica that's made and the costumes and that sort of stuff, that is still very popular collectible. And you can go on the, the auction sites online and you go to uh, these collectible shows and see that the prices are just going up and up and up. I think because Batman, the series, was such a classic that there will always be a resurgence of Batmania from time to time. And I think that's wonderful. There's a tremendous warmth and love for their characters. And I think uh, that it was an incredible opportunity that I got to portray Robin. That's one trouble with dual identities, Robin. Dual responsibilities. The show appeals on several levels. I have mail, for, for example, from 80-year-old Japanese industrialists. Man-eating lilacs, holy purple cannibals. And of course, the kids. But I think the reason Batman's hung out for so long is because it appeals to that spectrum of the uh, cats. Atomic batteries to power. Turbines to speed. Roger, ready to move out. Adam West is Batman. We left this world for Gotham City when we put on those costumes. And we loved it. As the duly deputized agent of the law, I place you under arrest. I think Adam West was brilliant. It would have been really difficult to have found somebody better. You jolly devil. Adam West was a self-mocking symbol of all that was wild, fresh, and fun in the 1960s. His dashing looks and comic flair lifted him from obscurity to superstar. As Adam West, how do you drive in a car? But after climbing to the top, the high living actor faced a villain even Batman couldn't beat, typecasting. Do you recognize me? And it would take two painful decades for West to make the transition from primetime superhero to pop culture icon. Adam West! Who loves Adam? People. People like Adam West. He was just a different cat. Hello, nice to be indoors. My father's always been very hardworking, very intellectual, and at the same time, a total goofball. Pure West. The man who became an idol to millions of baby boomers was born William West Anderson near Seattle, Washington, on September 19, 1928. His father, Otto, was a soft-spoken farmer. His mother, Audrey, was a talented singer who had dreamed of Hollywood stardom. But she settled unhappily for life on Otto's quiet farm in Walla Walla, where she buried her depression in alcohol and extramarital affairs. 
there's a curse running through our family of alcoholism and, and manic depression and uh, and that that's basically what his, his mother suffered from. Young Bill inherited his father's serious work ethic and Audrey's illness often forced him to be a surrogate parent to his younger brother, John. His mother's volatility also pushed the boy known as Wild Bill further into a world of fantasy. As a child, Bill loved to imagine himself living the adventures of his favorite movie heroes. His whole life he wanted to be a cowboy, so he loved to go to the movie theater for a nickel and watch all the great cowboys. And I think those guys kind of made an impression on him to become an actor. Influenced by his love of movies and his mother's passion for all things dramatic, Bill decided by his teens to become a performer. After his mismatched parents divorced in 1943, he was thrilled to move with his mother and brother to the bustling city of Seattle. There, the 14-year-old was enrolled at Lakeside High School, where he soon showed off his serious and wild sides. He did well in sports. He was president of his graduating class at school, but he was into making mischief. He stole a school bus one night to take a date to the prom, and he got a bunch of trouble for that. Moving on to nearby Whitman College, the handsome 21-year-old earned a degree in literature and psychology. He also fell in love with a pretty department store employee named Billy Lou Yeager, and in 1950, the pair married. But Bill Anderson hadn't forgotten his ambition to act. He channeled his off-the-wall humor into work as a radio DJ and helped launch a military television station where his passion for deadpan comedy continued to grow. Hawaii was Bill's next career stop when in 1955, a college friend offered Anderson the role of sidekick on a local TV kiddie program called The Kini Popo Show. He had a great time. This was an opportunity to live in this paradise and be on television and live this sort of hedonistic beach existence. In Hawaii, 28-year-old Bill became a local celebrity among children and adults. The only role he couldn't play was that of a conscientious husband. And in 1956, when his neglected wife asked for a divorce, Anderson blamed only himself. But Bill wasn't alone for long. That same year, he fell in love with a beautiful island dancer named Na Dawson. My dad saw her dancing and um... I, I think it was just one of those lust uh, things. I gotta have you. She said, I gotta have you. The pair married in 1957, and within two years, Bill became the proud father of two children, Janelle and Hunter. My dad's work, it took 100% of his time, but um, he still had 100% to give to the family, and it was amazing that he could do that. The would-be actor still dreamed of greater stardom, but ironically, it was his day job as an island tour guide that gave him his break. One day, his camera-ready looks caught the eye of a visiting TV agent who arranged for a Hollywood screen test. To Anderson's delight, his striking physique and smooth baritone won him a contract at Warner Brothers. Adam was a guy from a small town in Washington, so to come to Hollywood, oh, when he was a kid dreaming about being an actor, here he was, and he got a contract. He changed his name to the more dynamic Adam West, and he began to learn his craft in a range of television roles. That training paid off in 1959, when 31-year-old West got a part in the Paul Newman drama, The Young Philadelphians. The next year, his childhood dream of playing the hero came true with a recurring role on the hit TV series, The Detectives. Matt? Maybe I did run. Oh, now, wait a minute, Steve. 
I said I was going around to cover the rear, but maybe I was running from that fight. But that's a lot of nonsense. Matt, I was afraid last night. More afraid than I've ever been in my life. <laughs> With bullets flying all over the place, I wouldn't be afraid. This was different. In those few seconds, I felt it, the fear. I could taste the fear choking me. If I hadn't run out on him, he'd be alive right now. The detective was Adam's really first big break in Hollywood. That put him on the map. But as Adam West's career gained momentum, his personal life was again on the rocks. In 1962, Adam was devastated when his lonely wife, Na, left him for another man. He was uh, very pained by the fact that his second marriage fell apart. He loved Na very deeply and loved his children and never really got enough time to spend with them. West also grew frustrated as he tried to become more than a busy but little known actor. Despite a steady stream of supporting roles in film and TV, his dream of stardom seemed increasingly out of reach. That's one. What are you doing dressed? Are they uh, evacuating the building or something? What a thing to say. Can't I put on some clothes without evacuating the building? On Thursday afternoon at 4 o'clock? Oh, baby. What's the matter? I don't know. Nothing. Well, what is it, baby doll? You hate me. Even during his lean years, Adam was still developing his most unusual quality, his gift for quirky, straight-faced comedy. Oh, Madeline, it doesn't matter if she cries. Maybe I... she'll drop back home. If it's from the second floor, I'd like to give her an assist. Madeline, have you got a sleeping pill, a shot of whiskey? Crying is it's good for her. It's good exercise. Please, it won't Madeline. Work. She has to be changed. Oh, the dear soaking wet baby girl. Oh, my God. Wet? Oh, but what a good girl. Bobby, isn't it wonderful? Hey, what's the matter? The fire is out. But by 1965, Adam had few chances to use that talent. The best job he had was playing straight man to the Three Stooges in the Western spoof, The Outlaws is Coming. Here they is, the world's biggest nuts at their wackiest, in the wildest shootout ever to fracture the screen. Discouraged by his prospects in America, Adam traveled to Italy to star in the spaghetti western, The Relentless Four a low-budget knockoff of The Magnificent Seven. He considered staying in Europe to follow in the footsteps of his friend Clint Eastwood, who was becoming a star thanks to Italian westerns. But Adam's future was about to take a surprising turn, thanks to a commercial he'd made in which he used his comic flair to send up the current James Bond craze. I see automation displaces labor in your organization too, Dr. Sloan. Ah, oh, Captain Q. Join me in a glass of delicious chocolate quick, won't you? Thank you, Doctor. I could use some energy. And that Nestle's chocolate flavor is... The very best, Doctor. Incidentally, one of those torpedoes you fired at me was circling and... You're sunk. Toodaloo! Get thank you! Some people will do anything to get rich, quick. Toodaloo. Among those impressed by the ad was TV producer William Dozier, who was searching for an actor that could handle both action and comedy. And the resulting show would catapult Adam West from struggling actor to superstar. Since his creation in 1939, the crime-fighting superhero Batman had been a fixture in American entertainment. The character had evolved from comic books to movie serials of the 1940s, which closely followed the comic's melodramatic traditions. 
But in 1965, television producers William Dozier and Charles Fitzsimons set out to bring a knowing touch of satire to Batman and his stuffier alter ego, Bruce Wayne. It had to be played with total sincerity. You've got to find an actor uh, who is prepared to play Alice in Wonderland as though it were Hamlet. Test X1. Adam was amazing. Looks black as pitch, Dick. I've been through all my father's old law books. I don't see we have a leg to stand on. My identity exposed. My value as a secret crime fighter ended. Everything I have trained myself for since my parents were murdered. Gone. In the ash can. Up the chute. It's too terrible to face. He had humor in his speech, humor in his reactions, quick wit, and it's dry. It's an address. I get it. 222 Glover Avenue. You've done it, Chum. 222 Glover Avenue. That's the address of the new discotheque. What's the Riddler's game? Hold up the wealthy patrons? Could be. It's a famous haunt of high society. Let's just hope we're not too late. Let's go. I'll rev up the Batmobile. Wait a minute, Robin. They won't let you in. You're underage. It's the law. 37-year-old Adam relished the script's tongue-in-cheek tone and signed on to star. But slipping into Batman's character proved easier for Adam West than slipping in and out of his form-fitting wardrobe. It's not fun to wear tights. Sometimes you even walk funny. But I love the cowl, because the moment I pull on that cowl, suddenly I become the character. See, that's how I triggered it physically. Although Adam had confidence in the pilot, some ABC executives hated the show, especially after a disastrous test screening. It was the lowest rating they had ever had on anything. Now, had they not already bought the show, ABC, it would never have gone on the air. Adam knew that his entire career was at stake the night Batman premiered amid a wave of promotion on January 12, 1966. Batman! That Wednesday night, the caped crusader came through for Gotham City and for Adam West. Riddler. The game's up, Riddler. As a duly deputized agent of the law, I place you under arrest for armed robbery. Snap on the bat cuffs. You've got me, Batman. I thought Adam West was tremendously effective. He had lines that really weren't funny lines, but yet he made them funny. Yes? Batman, it's Robin. Robin, old chum. Where are you? Ho, ho, ha, ha. Remember me, old chum? You jolly devil. The key to Batman was a, a line that was in the pilot when Batman comes in in his full bat costume. And the, the maitre d' walks up to him and says, ringside table, Batman? Ringside table, Batman? And he replies, uh, Just look, thanks, I'll stand at the bar. I shouldn't wish to attract attention. Batman was a ratings blockbuster, and the life of its star would never be the same. His life completely changed within 24 hours. The next day, he couldn't even go to the supermarket. He had a beach house, and people were like clamoring at his windows. Adam was mobbed by children and adults alike. West's image adorned the covers of dozens of national magazines, as viewers tuned in twice a week to see TV's hippest show. It was a show that had humor and a writing style like no other. 
Batman took elements of adult culture and spoofed them within the context of a children's show, which in primetime television had never really occurred. Hollywood's top actors jostled to join Batman's all-star roster of villains. And as its success grew, the series writers played up its fresh vein of self-satire. The comic book character of Batman is just dumb. Suddenly, he started getting witty. He'd never been witty before. Suddenly, the villains started having a little edge to them. If I were to kiss you, would you think I was a bad girl? But, uh, no. No, of course not. Catwoman. Kissing is one of the most natural things in the world. Uh, some people kiss almost every day, and I'm told. It was brilliantly written. That's the most important thing in any script, in any show. And it was brilliantly cast. The atmosphere was fun and fast and humorous and easy. Adam would constantly kibitz. Have fun, make it light, make it fun. Watch it, chum. The dust you're in safety. Oh, sure. Sorry. At first, the camaraderie between Batman and Robin was not felt off screen. West considered 20 year old newcomer Burt Ward self absorbed and temperamental. It was the first thing that Burt ever did. Naturally, Bert had a lot of insecurities, which made him a pain in the beep, but many times. But there were so many times that you understood it, you understood why, you have the patience for it, and Bert grew, he developed. We were completely opposite. Adam had been in many shows, tremendous background, terrific actor, but very Mr. Hollywood. I mean, he wanted his tea at four o'clock in the afternoon. And me, I'm just like this kid that doesn't care having a good time. And I think that's one of the reasons that the public liked it, because Adam was very introspective. And I'm just this exuberant kid. By the end of the show's first season, Adam West and the Cape Crusader had become national icons. Where'd you get the idea for this hairstyle, Margaret? One evening I was watching The Batman on television. That mania swept America and the entire world. The biggest craze was the merchandise. There were more Batman gadgets, you know, than you could shake a stick at. Lunch boxes, cups, everything in the world. Yet they sold like hotcakes. Adam was thrust into the kind of celebrity that during the 60s was reserved for the Beatles, James Bond. If the Russians have anything to fear from you, actually, no, if their hearts are pure. The actor also loved going out on the town with some of Hollywood's most glamorous females. He took on this extraordinary bachelor life. Adam relayed a funny story to me one time that when he and Frank Gorshin attended one of the myriad orgies in the 60s, which were de rigueur for superheroes and supervillains, they were causing such a ruckus that they were actually asked to leave. But Adam West took his Batman celebrity very seriously when it came to keeping up the Cape Crusader's image in the eyes of his youngest fans. We had kids on the set all the time, and Adam was wonderful with the kids. He would visit with them between setups and let them come and sit on his knee, and the kids had a ball. He was so proud of being Batman. He was in such demand for personal appearances and everything. He was always going off someplace to appear in big uh, arenas and football uh, uh, coliseums and everything. He loved every minute of it. Emergency. Batman speaking. Warning all of you to brace yourselves for big news. The biggest. In the summer of 1966, Adam won even more fame with the role when he signed on at a salary of $100,000 to star in a big screen version of the show. The theatrical feature Batman pitted the superhero against Frank Gorshin's Riddler, Burgess Meredith's Penguin, Cesar Romero's Joker, and Lee Merriweather's Catwoman. Their minimum objective must be the entire world. Adam West was effective as Batman and Bruce Wayne because Adam West is two people. 
He has that straight, normal side, which is Bruce Wayne. Take the service elevator, meet me in the back cave, emergency. And then he has that wild, fun, wacky side, which would be the Batman side. In the motion picture, they are trying to get rid of a bomb. Four or five times, they try to get rid of it. And he stops and says, Some days you just can't get rid of a bomb. That was a tough role to play, you know, because he had to be careful. He could have been just out and out ridiculous, and he was great. But even as Batman, the TV show, returned for a second hit season, time was running out for the Cape Crusader. Brace yourself, Robin. This could be the end. And soon, Adam West would struggle to find a life outside the cape and cowl. Keep an eye on the scope. Watch for suspicious vessels. I'm watching, Batman. By 1967, Adam West had spent two years riding the wave of fame. But as Batman began production on its third season, the 39-year-old actor had reason to worry. ABC had cut the show from two nights a week to just one. And as ratings began to dip, Batman's producers decided to add some female sex appeal to the dynamic duo. Holy apparition! No, boy, wonder I'm Batgirl. Is the dynamic duo destined to become the triumphant trio? With delightful dynamic destruction. Which couldn't have been accomplished without you. For West, the addition of actress Yvonne Craig as Batgirl seemed a desperate move. But with time, Adam grew to like his new co-star. The nice thing they did for me was they made big eye holes for me because Adam's cowl left him virtually blind. I mean, every step forward and down that he took was an act of faith because he didn't have much vision at all in that thing. But changing the dynamic duo into the triumphant trio didn't deliver a knockout ratings punch. The cost was killing us. The sets were expensive. The special effects were expensive. The joke was over after two or three years. And uh, I think the public started to get a little bored with it. In 1968, West was stunned and deeply disappointed to learn that Batman would not return for a fourth season. The actor loved playing the role and reveled in the worldwide fame it brought him. Still, Adam was sure he could do much more than play the caped crusader. And he was confident he could make the leap from TV stardom to the big screen. But as weeks went by, the actor's telephone did not ring. And slowly, the 40-year-old realized that typecasting had brought his career to a dead end. I got clobbered pretty hard. The downside in a race that you're winning is, of course, when you cross the finish line and you collect the purse, the flash bulbs stop popping, and it's all over, you, you say, hey, what happened? I'm still here. Where's everybody else? Batman was a child of the 60s, and that also cast Adam into a time warp uh, where people thought of him purely and simply as a, an example of what was popular at that period of time. As months dragged by, West's frustration turned to deep depression. Acting jobs were few, and by 1970, his payments for Batman reruns had stopped. As job offers dwindled, the ex-superstar turned to alcohol to numb his pain. He's always struggled with depression. It's sort of a curse in our family. And he's struggled very hard with it, but he's definitely overcome it. 
um, just through his efforts because he wants to. West refused to give up hope that his career would rebound, and occasionally a good part came his way. One was a supporting role in the 1971 drama, The Marriage of a Young Stockbroker, starring Richard Benjamin. Am I to understand that you have treated Chester? You certainly. But, and I don't mind adding that his whole adjustment is due to that. Wouldn't you say so, dear? Chester? I would, dear. If it weren't for Dr. Sadler, we wouldn't be where we are today. <laughs> Doctor, instead of pretending that you help people, why not just say you have to make a living? And there's this thing you've learned to do with people and a couch. There's your money. Thank you for coming. Goodbye. Bill? No matter how bad things may be, they always could be worse. By the early 1970s, Adam realized he could not outrun his past. With an overwhelming sense of failure, the actor agreed to make personal appearances in his Batman costume at county fairs, rodeos, and circuses. One of the turning points in his career when he was offered um, a lot of money to be shot out of a cannon in Evansville, Indiana. That was definitely one of the low points in his career. Being inside of this cannon, it was such a major humiliation for him, not only as an actor, but he felt that his dignity as a man had just been shredded. But Adam's travels as Batman also led to one of the happiest events of his life. In the late 1960s, West appeared in costume at a promotion for Lear Jets, where he posed with executive John Lear and his young wife, Marcel. My mom's from France, and they don't have superheroes in France. They don't have grown men who dress in funny costumes. And so she thought Batman was a total freak. In the photo, you have my mom and her two children, and she is clutching her kids away from my dad because he, he's such a weirdo. But West could not forget the beautiful Marcel. And after learning of her separation from John Lear, the actor embarked on a romantic courtship. My father was filming a, a Western in, in Rome, and he knew my mom was around Geneva somewhere. So he flew to Geneva and just looked for her there and ran into her on the street. And she decided to give him a chance because he had, he had gone that far to pursue her. Adam West and Marcel Lear married in 1970. Their enduring union gave the actor two more children that he adored, Perrin and Nina, and a wife who gave Adam's life a new foundation. My dad had a lot of support out of my stepmother. and. You know, everybody around him still said, you're number one, you're, you're the greatest. And, you know, even if your career's not doing as well, you're still, when you come home, you're still the greatest. It's great to be here in Kansas City. It's great to be anywhere. With a young family to support, West took whatever work he was offered over the next decade. Do you recognize me? Yeah. Do you really? Yeah. I'll just stand here for a few moments and let you admire my incredible crime-fighting physique. I better not stand up here and talk too long because I don't want you to have to wait too long. And I know what the kids do when you wait with the kids and on your necks and sometimes the accidents. Uh, anyway, uh, you like my ears? Besides occasional appearances in the Batsuit, he tackled everything from quality projects like the Burt Reynolds comedy Hooper to low-budget embarrassments like The Happy Hooker Goes Hollywood. But Adam West's persistence was about to be rewarded. In the late 1980s, the struggling actor would enjoy a dramatic comeback, thanks to the very superhero who had sidelined his career. On September 19, 1988, Adam West turned 60. He was still in terrific health, but after 20 years trying to outrun Batman's shadow, the actor decided it was time for a break. 
Adam moved with his devoted wife, Marcel, and their children to the peaceful remote town of Ketchum, Idaho. It was basically like my father returning back to his, his roots. It was a really healthy environment for him and for a family to grow up in. Van Williams, who played the Green Hornet, is our neighbor. And he and my father have become great friends. And it's sort of funny to see them cavorting around Ketchum together. Fortunately, Hollywood had not forgotten Adam West or the character that made him a phenomenon. Here are the stars of that show, The Caped Crusaders, Adam West and Burt Ward. In 1988, two decades after Batman's cancellation, its cast reunited for the first time on a Fox Network late night talk show. Does this, uh, uh, this kind of response surprise you 22 years later, or is this... Uh... Holy adulation. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Ross, Ross, that's a wonderful thing about uh, being a part of this uh, thing called Batman. People always have uh, a wonderful warmth and rapport wherever we go in the world. Yeah, it seems yes. that way. Uh, I guess we've just been around that long. I don't know. <laughs> By the late 1980s, Batman was more than a memory as moviegoers around the world awaited a new big-budget feature starring Michael Keaton. But the project was a source of deep disappointment for West, who was hurt to be shut out from involvement in the year's hottest blockbuster. What Adam was hoping for and really deserved was the chance to make an appearance in that movie. But unfortunately, the producers did not show the respect to Adam's 22-year legacy and the legions, the millions of fans that he had amassed for the Batman franchise. He was disappointed in, in the new Batman just because it wasn't child-friendly. He was protective of the character. Despite the actor's disappointment, the hype and success surrounding director Tim Burton's movie would give Adam's career a major boost. In 1989, he was happy to star in a publicity campaign for the original series, which returned to airwaves around the world to coincide with the new film. Batman is bigger than ever, and now's the perfect bat time for audiences to get another look at all 120 half hours of one of the best produced and most successful shows in the history of television. There may be others in the field, but no one can duplicate the enormous power of TV's classic, Batman. Adam became a huge celebrity, made a major press tour of London, and was soon touring around the United States, and Adam was ecstatic. West was also thrilled to realize that the performers and producers now on top in Hollywood were children of the 1960s, who'd grown up idolizing Adam as Batman. Once again, the doors of Hollywood began to open. During the 1990s, West made appearances on many of America's most popular TV shows, among them, The Simpsons, a series created by another of his childhood fans, Matt Groening. I have all the people we've had on the show, and we've had a lot. Adam West really got all these guys <laughs> to come out of their writer's offices and actually sit there and go, oh my God, it's Batman. <laughs> oh, I guess you're only familiar with the new Batman movies, Michelle Pfeiffer. <laughs> The only true Catwoman is Julie Newmar, Lee Merriweather, or Eartha Kitt. And I didn't need molded plastic to improve my physique. Pure West. And how come Batman doesn't dance anymore? Remember the bat to see? <clears throat> West also loves starring in a 1991 TV pilot titled Look Well created specially for Adam. It was co-produced by former Simpsons writer Conan O'Brien and remains a cult favorite among Hollywood insiders. You know, I recognize you. Aren't you Ty Lookwell? Yes, but until this audition's over, I prefer to be addressed as Buzz McCool. Well, it's nice to meet you. You know, I remember Banachek. That was a great show. No, I wasn't Banachek. That was George Pappard. I was Bannigan. Brannigan? No, that was Hugh O'Brien. I was Bannigan. Oh, right, right. You had the black secretary. No, that was Mannix. I had a sheepdog. Right. It's just hysterically funny. I've seen it. I must have watched it ten times. 
Adam plays a former TV detective who, because he received a honorary crime-fighting badge from the police... This was given to me in 1972. Now, some 10 or 15 years after his show has been canceled, <laughs> takes his crime-fighting seriously. He plays a guy who's a little off-kilter. Uh, it's a big stretch. Good evening. I have a home. Hello, nice to be indoors. Hi there, the sidewalk is my pillow. It is probably the funniest half hour television show I may have ever seen. And Adam was just, you know, I don't know anybody else who could have done it. I'm gonna pay a visit to a certain auto painting shop, one that's close to the crimes, and yet large enough to tuck away a stolen car or two without anyone noticing. We only charge 60 bucks to paint these things, so we like to move them in and out pretty quick. I'll bet you do. OK, guys, get to it. Oh, Phil, if there's anything else you'd care for me to do, just let me know. Is he gay? Hey, it don't matter, as long as he does a good job. Just give me the signal. I'll deliver. Look, man, we're not into that stuff. That's not what I heard. By the 1990s, Adam had not only reconciled himself to his Batman past, thanks to a run of high-quality projects on TV and film, West proved he could embrace his old alter ego and move forward as an actor. And finally, best known as Batman from the classic TV series, he can be seen in the soon-to-be-released film Joyride, Adam West! During the late 1990s, Adam West balanced his quiet family life in Idaho with choice work on film and television. One of the actor's favorite projects was the talk show, Politically Incorrect. His appearances were so popular that by the year 2000, the 72-year-old had appeared nine times. Adam West? Wow. I know. <laughs> Holy wow. Yes. <laughs> I think you mentioned and all that incredible dialogue, it is. right? It's always incredible. You are larger than life. Anyway, don't get me started. <laughs> well, he's a great guest for me. He's um, funny. He's well read. You know, he still gets a huge round of applause. They hang on his every word. Words come out of no other human being quite the way they come out of Adam. This is an amazing statistic. In the outskirts of Paris, there are 200,000 people living in polygamy. And many oh, of them... Oh, pygmies in Paris? <laughs> Not pygmies. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, just because they're, they're short, there's just no reason to persecute them. Many stars from the 60s certainly are not welcome on Politically Incorrect, Howard Stern, David Letterman, The Tonight Show, but Adam is. He and William Shatner are probably the two icons from the 60s who are working more now than they did really 30 years ago. I get a phone call in the late 90s for Adam to appear in Argentina. He says, well, Fred, I'm very big in Argentina. I'm like the Beatles down there. And I said to myself, yeah, sure he is. We get off the plane. There's several hundred news guys. 25,000 people over three days showed up. What is not yours? I love watching my dad interact with his fans because his fans revere him and he doesn't disappoint them. He is the most genuine, um, nice person and he will speak to each individual um, personally. He gives them everything they expected. Batman, we tried to do it so that when you were young, you were little niños, uh, see, you would enjoy all of the excitement, adventure, color. But these chicos sentían mystery, misterio, la acción, el color. What's he see? Who are you? <laughs> More than three decades after catching his first Gotham City criminal, Adam West continues to celebrate his image as a pop culture icon. He understands exactly who and where he is, and he's happy with it, which makes him appealing. 
There's always a danger when you meet people who you've admired from afar. They will have feet of clay and they'll be jerks, but you know, he's a great example of somebody who was not. He's a good guy. My dad is an everyday guy that treats everybody the same, you know, fairly and nicely. And even if he's down here in Los Angeles, he would be sitting there having lunch with the grips or the stagehands. Or, uh, he's just a real down-to-earth person. He complains from time to time about Batman being typecast, but I think that if he had to go back and do it again, he would accept the role. Just because he's had the opportunity that most people don't get. I mean, he's the hero to millions of people, and he's taught so many good lessons to children that he wouldn't trade that for anything. I know that Adam is extremely proud of his work on the Batman series. The show was an alternative universe, and Adam was the king of that universe. Actors, uh, I think they want some kind of acceptance or communication. Some are even hungry for love, I guess, from their audience. I get a lot of that. I'm probably the luckiest guy around. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure working with you. If you need me again, here's my headshot. And now, people of Gotham City, the moment you have all been waiting for. <laughs> for millions of fans, he will always be remembered as that villainous rascal, the Joker, on the hit television series, Batman. He brought that enormous energy into everything he did. <laughs> Delicious. But before donning the grease paint and green hair, Cesar Romero was one of Hollywood's most versatile actors who maintained a sense of style and sophistication in every role he played. He was a split personality. He was a baggy pack comedian. How do you do? And the other side, he was terribly dignified. He was a gentleman's gentleman. He would kiss the hand. He would put his arm around you. He made you feel like a delicate little orchid. While he lived the life of a carefree Hollywood bachelor, Romero's devotion to his family always took center stage. He held the family together, and he supported the family. He was just a tremendous guy. I think everybody who knew him loved him. New York City, 1907. A bustling metropolis enjoying unprecedented prosperity brought on by the Industrial Revolution. It was here on February 15th that Cesar Julio Romero Jr was born into a life of privilege and affluence. His father, Caesar Sr., was a successful exporter of machinery to Cuba's sugar plantations. The hard-working businessman brought to his family a sense of old world values. My father was, I guess you might say, a typical Spaniard type. That is, in those days, the father ruled the roost. What he said went, or else there would be some dire consequences. Caesar's mother, Maria, was the daughter of Jose Marti, the man known as the liberator of Cuba. Through her father's encouragement, she had blossomed into one of the most promising musical talents in New York. She was uh, very musical. When she was 18 years old, she sang in Carnegie Hall. But she gave that up when she married. The Romeros were one of the wealthiest Cuban families living in the United States and made sure that young Caesar and his older sister Maria were exposed to the finer things in life. He went to the opera with his uh, grandmother and with his parents, and uh, he loved theater. He was just a very cultured man of a privileged childhood. 
Caesar was raised to be a well-behaved little gentleman, although nothing pleased the gregarious youngster more than kicking up his heels in the kitchen of his parents' estate. As a child, the household had two or three servants from Puerto Rico. One of them was a maid, Victoria, and uh, she loved to dance, and uh, she'd be off in the kitchen practicing her steps to the radio, and little Caesar would sneak in there, and he loved to watch her dance, and she soon started teaching him steps, and uh, he proved to be very agile, and as he grew up, it became a passion with him. To his mother's delight, Caesar had inherited her poise and grace, as well as her musical ability. When he was about eight or nine years old, he auditioned for the Metropolitan Opera to be in the boys' chorus and got in, and his father forbid it, wouldn't let him do it. His father totally did not approve of Caesar's ever considering going into any sort of theater or performing. While he was disappointed, Caesar was an obedient boy eager to please his father. He dutifully attended such prestigious private schools as Sanford in Redding Ridge, Connecticut, and Riverdale Country School in upstate New York. By 1921, the Romero household was filled with the laughter of two more children, a second daughter, Graciela, and another son, Eduardo. But only one year later, their idyllic lifestyle came to an end. The bottom fell out of Cuba's booming sugar market, destroying the family's business and forcing the Romeros to give up their many luxuries. Fortunately, Caesar Sr. had enough savings to keep his family afloat and he insisted his eldest son attend the collegiate school in New York City. Now over six feet tall and strikingly handsome, Caesar continued to make the most of his school years by joining the basketball team. But it was his skill on the dance floor that set him apart from his peers. He learned to dance because socially that was what you did and went to tea dances and he was on all the lists and he was invited to all the coming out parties because he was a good dancer. By the time Caesar graduated in 1925, the Romero's savings were beginning to dwindle. And to help support his family, he took a job as a courier at the First National Bank in Manhattan. While he was working at the bank, uh, he was not a very happy camper, and he wanted any way to get out of it. He had developed this real love and passion for dancing, and to him that was the most fun thing to do, so he loved to go to parties. And if he couldn't get invited on his own, he would crash these parties, and he became very adept at it. Maneuvering himself through New York's exclusive world of speakeasies, parties, and premieres, Caesar rubbed elbows with the city's most influential citizens. One of the people he met at these different parties he crashed and went to was Elizabeth Higgins, who wanted to have a dance team, which was quite the rage in the 20s. And because he was such a good dancer and they often partnered together, she suggested that they go into a dance profession together. Higgins was a wealthy socialite who offered to pay Romero $25 a week to quit his bank job and concentrate on developing their dance routines. Together, the pair eventually won a spot in the musical review, Lady Do. After the show closed, the 19-year-old teamed up with Florence Kelker for a series of engagements at such hot spots as the St. Regis Roof and the Ritz-Carlton. The tremendous crowds which you see gathered outside the Stock Exchange are due to the greatest crash in the history of the New York Stock Exchange in market prices. But in 1929, the stock market crash sent America's economy into a tailspin. Caesar's father lost what was left of his savings and all hope of ever rebuilding the family's fortune. My father didn't cope so well. Uh, he was in his 60s, early 60s, when everything went down the tube. And he had lost his, his life's work. For a while, they even were worried that he might try suicide. Caesar was concerned about his father's well-being, and as the eldest son, he took on the responsibility of supporting his parents and three siblings. The family lived on Caesar's income as a, as a dancer and a, and a performer. He took an allowance for himself and sent the rest down to his family. But his financial worries were relieved when he was spotted by Broadway producer Brock Pemberton. Impressed with Romero's charisma and aristocratic good looks, Pemberton took a chance on the newcomer and asked him to step into the lead role of Count de Ruvo for a nationwide tour of the hit show Strictly Dishonorable. 
For his stage debut, Caesar won the acclaim of theater critics, who were charmed by the classy young performer. The 23-year-old also captured the heart of nightclub singer Marion Harris, a woman 10 years his senior. Marion got him to, to grow a mustache, which became sort of his signature, and they had a hot and everything. And then she had an engagement to go to London, but he had a chance to do a show that was going to be going into New York, and he had these family responsibilities. He had to pay bills, and he needed the job, and she was so angry that he wouldn't go with her to London that that broke them up. I mean, he was disappointed about that, but he survived. As far as his true feelings, he didn't uh, show them. He kept them to himself pretty well. Romero's spirits picked up when he landed his first major Broadway role in the comedy Dinner at Eight. His deft comic performance as an insanely jealous chauffeur brought him to the attention of an MGM talent scout who offered the actor a one-year contract. He was certainly excited when he told us about the fact that he had gotten a contract. He said, I'm a little worried about uh, how it'll work out. I'll do my damnedest to stay there and be a movie actor. By now, even Caesar's father had accepted his choice of profession. And the whole family was excited as the 27-year-old boarded a train for California. In April of 1934, Caesar arrived in Los Angeles and was quickly welcomed into the glamorous Hollywood social scene. For his first studio feature, Romero played a gigolo in MGM's The Thin Man, starring William Powell and Myrna Loy. While the film was a huge hit, Romero went unnoticed, and MGM let his contract lapse. But Caesar had become a regular fixture on the nightclub scene and used the connections he made on the dance floor to his advantage. Because he would be at all the parties at nighttime with the different clubs, he developed a network of people who referred him to the next person to help him with his career. And before his MGM contract was finished, he was offered a contract over at Universal Pictures. Most of his time at Universal, however, was spent on loan to 20th Century Pictures, where head of production Daryl Zanuck made sure he was cast in a wide variety of roles. Who gave your ancestors those lands? The Crown. What a Crown can give, a Crown can take away. Ah, uh, but it is not the Crown who takes them away, but my Lord Cardinal. Every day you gather more power to yourself. Soon you will have the whole of France in the palm of your hand for your own selfish ends. Since your arch deposed, you will be king of all northern India. How many troops has he? 60,000 and 20,000 horses. So he proved in two pictures to Zanuck, he could play a Frenchman, he could play someone from India, and he had the zest and that exotic look that made him quite believable in both parts. And that cemented a friendship with Daryl Zanuck. But Romero believed that his big break had finally come when Paramount Pictures cast him opposite Marlena Dietrich in Joseph von Sternberg's The Devil is a Woman. And do you know who sent this? Your friend, Pasquale. You're a liar. Let me see it. He must be mad. Why, he told me that you destroyed his life. If I destroyed your life, you couldn't write such a letter, could you? I'd wring your neck. Kiss me, Von Sternberg, who was known for his ability to create some of the most beautiful images on screen, was the first director to fully emphasize Romero's stunning good looks. He was unlike anyone else in, the, in pictures. I don't know if anybody like him. He had a very regal look. He was very photogenic. His coloring was wonderful. He had the dark, polished hair and that whole sleazebag kind of look. I found it most enchanting because it was dangerous and yet safe, and I think women love that. Romero was pinning his hopes on the devil as a woman to catapult him to the top, but was disappointed when the film failed at the box office. Over the next two years, Universal continued to loan Caesar out to other studios for a series of supporting roles. Although he had only been in Hollywood for three years and already had made an astonishing 22 movies, Cesar Romero feared that at the age of 30, his career had peaked and he had nowhere to go but down.
may Allah bless and protect thee for the rest of thy days. Thank you very much. In 1937, Cesar Romero was on loan to the newly formed 20th Century Fox, where studio chief Daryl Zanuck put him to work in Rudyard Kipling's Wee Willie Winky, starring Shirley Temple. The film was directed by John Ford, and Romero was cast as Cody Khan, a regal chieftain whose heart is stolen by a pint-sized private. Please don't laugh at me, Mr. Khan. <laughs> Allah himself would laugh, my child. Then you want to fight, and I thought you were good. You had such nice eyes. Please, Mr. Khan, please don't have any war. Please don't. Between your people and mine, little one, there can be only war. His role as an Afghan rebel leader, which was both villainous and sympathetic, uh, did a lot for the picture and did a lot for his career. And Zanuck, who already was very fond of him, hired him on at Fox. Zanuck signed Romero to a seven-year contract and capitalized on his flair for comedy by teaming him with Don Amici, skating sensation Sonia Henney, and 28-year-old Ethel Merman in Happy Landing. Playing a philandering band leader, Caesar turned in an energetic performance that poked fun at his suave, sophisticated image. Lo and I are in love all over again, aren't we, darling? Oh, so you phoned him to come down here, did you? Yeah, I mean, no. Look, darling, it was like this. I... Oh! Oh! Oh, don't, Flo, don't. You know I'm crazy about you. I don't want to leave you. Now, look, I'm taking you back while you're still in one piece. Get your hat. We're leaving. He's not going with you. Now get out of here before I wrap this around your neck. Don't you throw that. One of the things that you notice about Romero once he started working at Fox is there's a levity about his performance. He was guaranteed a contract. He knew the studio boss liked him. He really developed and flowered and blossomed. Romero continued to delight audiences with his flair for slapstick when he reteamed with Henny in My Lucky Star. Hey, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. How do you do? Zanuck's strategy for Caesar was paying off, and the likable star continued to spice up a variety of films, including Wife, Husband, and Friend with Loretta Young and The Little Princess, which reteamed him with Shirley Temple. Enthralled by the glamour of the movie business, 31 year old Romero could be spotted nightly with Hollywood's brightest stars. And while he never got the girl in his pictures, off-screen, Caesar was the escort of choice for actresses like Linda Darnell, Ann Sheridan, and Joan Crawford. If you didn't have someone to take you, they'd, they'd get someone to... Caesar Romero was very busy. <laughs> he was escorting everyone. He took great care of us. He had, was a good conversationalist. And wherever we went, of course, there was always dancing. And it was just great fun to be with him. Caesar was a favorite guest on the A-list party circuit, where old friend George Murphy tagged him with an unlikely nickname. George Murphy was giving people nicknames, like the, the big fat guy he called Slim, and the bald guy he called Curly. And then he looked at Caesar and he said, hey, how you doing, Butch? And everybody just laughed because he was such a patent leather, elegant lover to call him Butch was like a riot and, and it, it stuck. But Hollywood hadn't gone to Caesar's head and family remained an important part of his life. After he became successful in Hollywood, he took care of his entire family. He moved them all out here. He put his brother through school. He paid for his niece's wedding and he kept a huge family afloat. In 1939, Romero made an appearance as a sidekick in The Return of the Cisco Kid, starring Warner Baxter. The Cisco Kid was one of Fox's most popular serial westerns, and when Baxter left the title role, Romero was asked to take over. Beginning in 1940 with Viva Cisco Kid, Cesar Romero seamlessly stepped into the boots of the Latin hero. I'm <laughs> You like this? Exciting, no? I must confess it isn't dull. No, it is never dull with Senor Don Juan Chicuelo. It's always big excitement, big danger. You're a very good driver. Oh, gracias. You know, it's very funny. This is the first time I ever drive a stagecoach. <laughs> Over the next two years, he starred in five more installments of the successful series. Oh, will you have a drink with me? 
No, but I'll dance with you. Hmm. Senorita, it's an honor. In this period, playing the Cisco Kid, he got awful lot of fan mail, and this came in every week. And he, to a lot of women, was a sex symbol, and it made him a leading man and a star at 20th Century Fox. With his career soaring, Romero splurged on a sprawling French colonial home in Brentwood, a favorite neighborhood for many of Hollywood's most illustrious stars. Oh, it was unbelievable. We were on Salt Air, just north of Sunset, and then the first house was Cesar Romero, whom we all called Butch, and a couple of houses up was Jerome Power and Annabella's next door, Rocky and Gary Cooper. It was so fun, you know, in those days. Everybody was younger than springtime and having a ball. It was a, a wonderful, magical time. Romero and neighbor Tyrone Power immediately hit it off and became fast friends. He loved Tyrone. I know he loved this man. They were like buddies, and they ran around together. They double dated. But Tyrone Power was such an unbelievable star that there was a part of Caesar that was starstruck himself that I don't think he could believe that his best friend was Tyrone Power. By the end of the 1930s, Europe was being torn apart by a Second World War, which threatened to spill over onto American shores. To develop allies in South America, the United States initiated the Good Neighbor Policy, intended to strengthen ties between the two continents. When Hollywood quickly joined the propaganda campaign, Cesar Romero's Latin looks and Cuban heritage made him one of the hottest tickets in town. Mia, how can I gamble when I have no money? When I have proved that with my own eyes, I still will not believe it. No, Rosita, no. <laughs> no. Let me search you. With me, it is a question of dignity. Can't you wait until you're asked? No. No, Rosita, they have it. No, me ask. In 1941, Fox paired him with Brazilian bombshell Carmen Miranda in their big budget extravaganza, Weekend in Havana co-starring John Payne and Alice Faye. He would add a little bit of humor to it, a little bit of a glint in his eye, a little bit of comedy, and then cast Carmen Miranda. And so to put the two of them together was creating a very combustible force. I have spent your money. I have lost at gambling. I have lied to you, but never have I been untrue to you. Yeah, yeah, I believe it. I have only gone with Senorita Spencer because I lost your money. I was trying to earn some to give back to you. Senor Williams paid me to take her out. What? What? Wait a minute. Come on, you. Come on. Is it true what this liar say? Well... Oh, so you had to arrange even this, you... You heel! Ah. Weekend in Havana was the perfect vehicle for Romero's many talents, and the Latin lovers' sizzling chemistry warmed the hearts of audiences across the country. The following year, Caesar was reteamed with Carmen Miranda and John Payne for the musical comedy... Springtime in the Rockies, also starring Betty Grable. You want me here because you're lonesome, then you try to get rid of me. You want me to come, you want me to go. Now, what do you want me to do? I'll tell you, Victor. What, Vicky? Let's play gin rummy. G gin rummy? Are you kidding? Paired with Grable on the dance floor, Romero showed off some of the nimble steps that had once made him the toast of Manhattan. any kind of a dance to walk. It's very surprising to see someone that large uh, in stature to be so nimble. And he was, he was very graceful. I loved to watch him dance, I really did. Hi, Majita Bucks. Can you cut the rug? I can cut the rug just like a Yankee doodle dandy. In 
just five years, Cesar Romero had gone from contract player to one of the biggest stars in Hollywood. But the world was about to change, and so too was Romero's carefree life in the limelight. On December 7th, 1941, Japanese bombs fell on Pearl Harbor, plunging the United States into the Second World War. 35-year-old Cesar Romero enlisted in the military along with such stars as Jimmy Stewart, Clark Gable, and Tyrone Power. Assigned to an assault transport, Caesar patrolled the waters of the Pacific. He saw so many of the movie stars going into the service, and here he was, a bachelor. I'm not sure why he picked the Coast Guard, but he deliberately enlisted as an enlisted man. He said he didn't feel it proper that they walk in and say, here I am, a celebrity, make me an officer. The unassuming actor insisted on no special treatment from his shipmates, but Caesar found it impossible to escape his celebrity. The Marines uh, all around recognized him. He said, hey, Cisco, hey, Cisco this, Cisco that. Look, hey, give me your autograph. In 1944, after eight months at sea, Bosun's mate Romero was shipped stateside to make morale-boosting appearances at munitions factories across the country. When peace was declared in 1945, Caesar returned to Los Angeles, where he was greeted by a house full of relatives. When the war ended, Caesar came back, and there was a house full of family, and uh, there was no room for Caesar, the master of the house. So he said, don't worry about it. He said, I'll build an apartment over the garage. With a large family to support, Caesar was anxious to return to work, but he worried that his three-year absence from the screen may have hurt his career. Romero's first assignment after the war was in the musical comedy Carnival in Costa Rica. The film performed modestly at the box office, but Caesar had high hopes for his next project. He was set to co-star with his old pal Tyrone Power in an adaptation of the best-selling novel Captain from Castile. Hoping to drum up publicity for the production, 20th Century Fox sent Caesar and Tyrone on a promotional tour of South America. Tyrone Power and Cesar Romero are off on a vacation. Wonder where they're going. Well, we're going to start off with Mexico, then go to Guatemala and the other Central American republics. So from California, they start on that quiet, lazy vacation. Panama is the first stop. They're received by President Jimenez. Their vacation becomes a goodwill tour. Butch told me later that was the greatest thing that ever happened to him the most fun he'd ever had in his whole life. And I can imagine it because Ty had a great sense of humor. When the 10-week excursion ended, the two friends were whisked off to Mexico, where cameras began to roll on the studio's most expensive production of the year, Captain from Castile. We stand knocking at the very door of the great Emperor Moctezuma. We shall meet his majesty face to face, have done with ambassadors and specks of gold. This gentleman, it's just the beginning. It was really a very demanding movie. It gave Caesar a, a very big part, but a part that caused for great dimension. He was playing the conqueror of Mexico, and he was on screen a great deal of the time. In fact, he really is the grounding force of the picture. You, sir! Do you forget where you are? You dare draw your sword at my table? No, sir, the family this man speaks of is my family. The murdered girl was my sister. I thought I made it clear. We'll have no brawling. Sir, do you realize what this man represents? With him, the Santa Hermandad, with all its evils, has come to the new world. Are you a soldier, Captain de Vargas? If not, hand me your sword. Captain from Castile re-established Cesar Romero as one of Hollywood's most popular and charismatic stars. But in a town where gossip was a favorite pastime, celebrities often found their private lives and sexual habits open to speculation. At the age of 40, the handsome Romero was still unmarried, and rumors about his sexuality and close friendship with Tyrone Power were beginning to raise eyebrows. They were on location for a long time down in Mexico. So when they got back in town, they were gone a couple of months, then rumors started that they were having an affair, but I don't think so. There are a lot of stories, of course, that have been passed around. It never occurred to me that there was anything but a very fast, wonderful friendship. And if it extended to more than that, well, 
Who am I to care? Preferring to remain private, Caesar ignored the gossip and reported back to work at 20th Century Fox Studios. Now in his 40s, his years of being the hot-blooded Latin lover were coming to an end. In 1950, when he was cast in Love That Brute, a remake of his earlier film, Tall, Dark, and Handsome, Romero's current place in Hollywood became all too apparent. It had been filmed in 1941, and uh, he played the lead in that part. And then ironically, when the picture was remade in 1950, Caesar had the part of the gangster, the subordinate part. So it's sort of a reversal of fortune, you might say. Shushan, it's not a ghost, but that isn't your fault. But you were buried. That wasn't me. Just a reasonable facsimile. It's you, Ed. It's not a ghost, but that ain't your fault. But, but you're dead. I, I seen you. We, we buried you. Not me, you willy boy. Just a nice, willing substitute. Didn't even argue. In 1951, 20th Century Fox decided not to renew Caesar's contract, ending their 15-year relationship. With his career in jeopardy, the pressure was beginning to mount on the aging actor. He hit a point in time where he had all these mouths to feed and he was down to his last several thousand dollars and called his agent and said, you know, I'll do shopping center openings, I'll do television, which at that time was like a terrible thing. But for Cesar Romero, television offered a new beginning. Throughout the 1950s, the versatile performer was a popular guest star on a variety of highly rated programs. In 1954, Romero even headlined his own series, Passport to Danger, which lasted one season. Caesar's bread and butter may have come from television, but the 47-year-old was still very much in demand on the big screen. Over the next several years, the debonair character actor kept himself busy in a string of high-profile films. But in 1958, Caesar suffered a devastating personal loss when his closest friend, Tyrone Power, passed away. Well, it certainly was a shock to anybody to see that uh, Tyrone, at such a young age, 44, suddenly dies of a heart attack. It gave people pause. And certainly Caesar, who was older, uh, it may made him think of his own mortality. But this was his great friendship in life, and he would never have another one as close as that. Greatly saddened by Tyrone's untimely death, Caesar threw himself into his work. But on October 17, 1962, he received yet another crushing blow when his beloved mother died at the age of 81. She was elderly, it was old, his father had died, and he knew it was inevitable. And it was shortly before Christmas, and he was, you know, heartbroken. The post-war years had brought Cesar Romero a number of personal setbacks, but through it all, he managed to maintain a successful career. The veteran actor's next assignment, however, was about to bring him more fame than he could ever imagine. As the 1960s got underway, Cesar Romero was still a vital part of the motion picture industry, lending a distinguished air to any film in which he appeared. But the Hollywood that had once enthralled Romero had lost much of its luster since the demise of the studio system. He was always talking about the good old days, the big parties with all the stars, and how this Hollywood wasn't like that anymore. He'd say in the old days, if you were a star, you were a star forever. I think maybe he missed it. The 1960s were a decade of youthful exuberance. Children of the post-World War II baby boom, now in their teens, 
were shaping American culture, and their influence could be seen in everything from fashion to films. <laughs> Television quickly jumped on the bandwagon with a tongue-in-cheek adaptation of the comic book, Batman. Starring Adam West and Burt Ward as the dynamic duo, Batman premiered on January 12th, 1966. Nobody thought when they started doing the series that it would become such a big hit. The studio decided to do two or three things to bolster it up. They decided not to play it straight, but to make it very campy. Ringside table, Batman. Uh, just look at the tanks. I'll stand at the bar. I shouldn't wish to attract attention. And to use a lot of guest stars. Among the rogues gallery of special guest villains were Burgess Meredith as the Penguin, Frank Gorshin as the Riddler, Julie Newmar as Catwoman, and 58-year-old Cesar Romero as the Joker. <laughs> oh, how delicious it is! The Joker outwits Batman and steals the fabulous jewel collection right out from under his nose! <laughs> Oh, my playful pilfering pals! How delicious it is! We hate to sound a sour note, Joker. But it's time for us to make our own collection. Destroy them! Cesar Romero brought an enormous amount of energy to the role. His piercing eyes, his, his laugh. I don't know how he did it, because he, he wasn't 22 when he did it. He did have a great inner force, and as the Joker, he let that loose. You saw that wildness, that power, even though it was a silly power. When I get in an outfit like that, I'm not going to sit there and going, ha, 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 I'm going to go, ha, 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 You fall right into it. I thoroughly enjoyed playing the Joker. It's time for you to sing a different tune, my crooked clown. Songs of the parties, my cape copper. <laughs> and so is confetti. <laughs> the Joker added a new dimension to Romero's already colorful palette of characters. But underneath the villain's pancake makeup, there was still a hint of the real Caesar. He said, ah, uh, I can't shave my mustache. Um, and we wondered why, but when you think about it, he had such an illustrious and long career and always with the mustache and very dashing. And so we said, okay, you don't have to shave the mustache, we'll just plaster the white makeup on over your mustache. Within a few weeks of its premiere, Batman became a national phenomenon, inspiring hairstyles, fashions, and a dance called the Batusi. Batmania was at its peak. In the summer of 1966, 20th Century Fox released a feature-length Batman film that pitted the dynamic duo against every supervillain in the book. Why are you sniveling, Sardine? Are you pompous, puffed-up penguin? Your friends make peace. Have a shake on me. <laughs> Ooh, a joke a day keeps the gloom away. He could open up this other side of him that was so ridiculous. And this thing came out with the big red lips, and he really hammed it up. And he loved it. He said, oh, yeah, that was great fun. He really enjoyed it. It's all set. He puts his foot here, my secret jack-in-the-box fires, shooting him up through the window, out over the sea, into the waiting arms of penguins exploding octopus. <laughs> what a deliciously humorous trajectory! And nothing to link <laughs> us with the crime. <laughs> Despite his new fame as the clown prince of crime, Cesar Romero's sense of impeccable style could still be seen when he became a spokesman for Petrocelli suits. That man, when he came out of the shower, I think, stood tall and lean and wonderful. And I never saw, but I bet his shorts were embroidered and they were just gorgeous because everything about him was meticulous. And maybe this comes from his upbringing in wealth or whatever, but he always dressed like a gentleman. By the age of 61, Cesar Romero had basked in the glow of Hollywood's glory days, helped usher in the golden age of television, and had become a pop culture icon in the process. But could he escape the role that had turned his career around? 
A high-speed computer accidentally drains its brain into a not-so-bright campus cloud. I think I found a spot for you in my organization. In the early 1970s, the ever-adaptable Cesar Romero appeared with teen star Kurt Russell in a series of Disney films that included the computer wore tennis shoes and the strongest man in the world. But while 68-year-old Caesar was still eager to work, film roles for the silver-haired character actor were becoming increasingly rare. Unable to give up the profession that had brought him so much joy, he split his time between dinner theater engagements and television guest appearances. As long as he was working, that's all he cared about. He didn't think in terms of career and is this a smart move or that. It was, will they pay my fee? And then I go to work and I'm a professional. And he loved going to work. In 1985, the suave star got a chance to act with longtime friend Jane Wyman when he was cast as Peter Stavros in the nighttime soap opera Falcon Crest. When the writers came up with the fact that they wanted me to get married again, the list of men came in. And in it was Cesar Romero. I said, you stop right there. I mean, you don't have to go any farther. Caesar relished the glamorous settings on the show, which harkened back to Hollywood's heyday. The role also put Romero back in the spotlight, reminding countless fans of his timeless appeal. Well, uh, in three months, I'll be 80. He's just right for me. He's what? He's right for me. <laughs> right for you? Okay. I'll meet you after the show. Okay. <laughs> Romero was now an elder statesman of a bygone era, and he began to gather accolades for his professional achievements, including the Nosotros Golden Eagle Award for his success as a Latino working in the entertainment industry. But on March 24, 1991, Caesar mourned the loss of his sister Maria, who died at the age of 85. The siblings had spent the last two decades living together, and Caesar had grown dependent on Maria's companionship and support. He really surprised us all by, you know, handling it as well as he did, I guess, because, yeah, they were lifetime partners. You know, they weren't married couple, but they may as well have been. He pondered not having gotten married. Yes, there was a certain amount of loneliness, but his life was so full of people that I don't think he had much time for that. He was far too busy. His dance card was very full. But Romero's health was becoming fragile, and in 1993, he checked into St. John's Hospital in Santa Monica, California. There, he successfully underwent treatment for severe bronchitis and pneumonia, and looked forward to getting back to work. As long as he was working, he was alive when he was in the hospital, he was growing a beard because he said, you know, maybe I'll get a part as an old man. He's still working the angles here. How can I be more castable? But as he was recuperating, complications arose from an undetected blood clot. And on New Year's Day, 1994, Cesar Romero died of heart failure. He was 86 years old. There was nothing anybody could do. It was terrible shock. We had talked to him and he was feeling fine. And then all of a sudden we learned that he had died. In a career that spanned 60 years and hundreds of performances, from the womanizing Latin dancer who chased Betty Grable and Carmen Miranda to Batman's greatest foe, the Joker, Cesar Romero always personified the glamor of Hollywood's golden era. But it was the vibrant actor's kind and giving spirit that earned him the respect and the love of fans, family, and friends. I know he's at peace, and I know he's with his family, and God will take care of him because he was a good man. To me, he's captain of Castile, on that horse looking so gorgeous. He was a thorough gentleman, and everybody loved being with him. He was just so handsome, and he had an aura about him, a true star gentleman aura. 
magnificent. You couldn't see him come up the walk and not smile and know you were going to have a good time. A loyal, fun friend. The Catwoman is not like the others. I'll show you how to clip Batman and Robin's wings. I will prevail. Catwoman is what she really is. A little sex, a little glamour, a little pizzazz. That's Julie. Who else than her have to spill an aggressive, fabulous explosion of, of joy, of energy? It's unbelievable. Besides the sensual aspect, she had great humor and wit. Show business is such a rewarding profession. <laughs> To audiences, Julie Newmar represented the epitome of glamour, sex appeal, and idealized femininity. Don't fight it. But behind the public persona, television's most famous feline spent her life devoted to fitness, family, and a son afflicted with a debilitating disorder. Her physical persona was probably what put her in the public eye. And I think what kept her in the public eye was her intelligence. Perfect. No one say anything frivolous for the next few moments. I am having a significant experience. Whoopee! Look, Miss Julie Newmar has been watching silently over this entire conversation. And look at her vintage Miss Julie. She is the perfect, the ultimate... Oh, try to describe her and not use the word statuesque. Oh, Miss Julie, you are statuesque, and you were the only cat woman. The woman who would forever be known as America's feline femme fatale was born Julie Shalane Newmeyer on August 16th, 1933. The first child of Helene and Donald Newmeyer, Julie grew up in the exclusive neighborhood of Los Feliz, California where palm trees arched gracefully over the luxurious homes of Hollywood's rich and famous. Julie's father, Donald, was a playful and devoted parent, determined that his children would be examples of both academic and athletic excellence. He was a civil engineering professor at uh, LA City College and also coached the football team. He lived for it, he loved his teams. He was an avid sportsman, golfing, bowling, skiing and uh, it rubbed off on Julie. Julie and her younger brother, Peter, were natural athletes, but the hours they spent climbing and tumbling with their father were meant to be more than mere fun. They were lessons in physical discipline. But her mother, Helene, a former Ziegfeld Follies beauty, had more genteel goals in mind for her daughter. She left the Follies after an auto accident. Uh, she was kind of an um, artistic sort, um, very much more of a romantic and uh, um, imaginative sort than, than our dad. Young Julie had inherited her mother's artistic bent, and Helene quickly saw that through her daughter, she could fulfill her own frustrated ambitions. Julie was raised in a rarefied atmosphere of culture and beauty and encouraged to rise above the ordinary. By the age of five, the precocious child could read music. When she also showed an affinity for dance, her mother immediately enrolled her in ballet school. She had the idea that Julie would be graceful and uh, skilled. Early on, was, it was obvious that she had a physical sense and grace. Now, mother gave her all of the social graces and the dancing and the piano lessons. Her mother was sort of grooming her for, for uh, better things. Julie was everything her parents had hoped for, an obedient child who thrived under their lavish attentions. At the age of seven, she was at the top of her class in both academics and dance. Her mother was so encouraged by her daughter's talent, she signed her up for a local department store production of Alice in Wonderland. On stage, Julie loved being the center of attention, but at home, she didn't mind sharing the spotlight. In 1942, she and Peter were joined by a third sibling, John, and the nine-year-old happily became both Pied Piper and protector to her little brothers.
In September of 1947, Julie entered John Marshall High School, and students watched in awe as the now nearly six foot tall, self-possessed freshman glided through the halls. She literally stood head and shoulders above her classmates, but it was her unconventional personality that set her apart. Her look and her size and her stature belie what she really is. Julie was a flower child before we knew what flower children were. She was always wispy and ethereal and gentle. While other teenage girls were going to drive-ins with their bows, Julie found she had little in common with her peers. She didn't have not only boyfriends, but she didn't have too many girlfriends. You're going to school and you're doing homework and then you're going to dance lessons and, and practicing the piano and, and all of those kinds of things. You don't have that much time for a huge social life. Julie's life revolved solely around dance and she spent her weekends performing as a ballerina with one of LA's local opera companies. With an above average IQ, the straight A student also managed to finish high school a year ahead of schedule. Julie felt she was ready to become a professional dancer, but her mother saw an opportunity to broaden her daughter's education. With the youngest brother John in tow, they boarded a plane for Europe. Now exposed to old world museums and architectural wonders, and surrounded by sophisticated adults, the 17-year-old no longer felt out of place and for the first time delighted in the attention of ardent admirers. There were calls and callers all the time. One was a matador who presented her with the uh, ears of the bull uh, after the bullfight that we attended. That was a bit of a uh, honor. It opened the imagination to Julie that uh, staying in school or going to college would not have done. Rather than disappoint her father, in 1951, Julie enrolled in UCLA, but her heart was not in the classroom. Just a few weeks later, she shocked her parents by dropping out of college to join the prestigious Jack Cole dancers. Her father was convinced she was throwing her life away. Her mother was secretly thrilled. Within months, the teenager made her film debut as a chorus girl in the Bing Crosby Jane Wyman musical, Just For You. Before long, she was making uncredited appearances in a series of sword and sandal B movies, such as Slaves of Babylon and Demetrius and the Gladiators, starring Victor Mature and Susan Hayward. But to be a member of the chorus, a dancer had to fit in and Julie Newmeyer always stood out. Her height and imposing physical presence immediately set her apart, and she began to originate her own dance combinations. Universal Studios soon hired the 20-year-old as one of their staff choreographers. There, she taught such up-and-coming starlets as Anita Ekberg, Julie appeared not to notice as heads turned when she went speeding past studio guards every morning, tousled hair flying behind her, invariably an hour late. But in 1953, she met novelist Louis L'Amour and decided to slow down. After a passionate romance, 45-year-old L'Amour was desperate to make Julie Newmeyer his wife, and she was soon seen around town sporting a Cartier engagement ring. He was just wild about her, though. We'd, we'd see each other, you know, here or there, and somehow I would look at the guys I was dating, and they all looked like such little twerps. And Louis was so sophisticated, but then Julie appeared to be so very sophisticated, too. But it was not Julie's sophistication that won her a role in MGM's newest A-list musical extravaganza. In search of the industry's finest dancers, the studio gave Julie her first big break, when they cast her as Dorcas Galen in Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. The film starred Howard Keel, Jane Powell, and Ruta Lee as one of the brides held hostage in a mountain cabin. Which of the boys slept in this bed, do you suppose? <gasps> Dorcas Galen! 
Galen. What's the matter? Didn't you ever think of that? That you're sleeping in one of their beds? <gasps> Alice, come away from that window this minute. I notice that you peek out often enough when you think no one's looking. I never. I saw you. So did I. You take that back. Oh, you dare say a thing like that about Martha. And what were you doing last night? Out at the wood pile. Oh, you! With choreography by Michael Kidd, Julie was sure that Seven Brides for Seven Brothers would be the perfect showcase for her dancing. But finding a partner tall enough or good enough proved impossible. They matched her up with someone that was equal in height. And the actor that played the brother that took Julie as a bride couldn't dance. I'd be pleasured if you'd allow me. Why, thanks. Oh, he was gorgeous, Jeff Richards. But he wasn't any dancer. He was a baseball player. He knew how to slide into something, but that's all he knew. So Julie didn't really get to dance very much with darling Jeff. The beautiful dancer was frustrated to be relegated to the background where her talents went unnoticed. But Julie's eccentric personality always left an impression. Suddenly, the director yells, cut, cut. Julie has reached into her ample bosom during the scene and pulls out a piece of cheese, which she likes to keep at body temperature and starts to eat the cheese during the scene. And the director says, what in hell are you doing? So, well, I felt my energy flagging, and I just needed a little piece of cheese for a pick-me-up. And we all kind of stared, and only beautiful Julie could get away with that. Seven Brides for Seven Brothers was a huge hit. The studio immediately sent Julie and her fellow brides on a lavish publicity tour of the Southwest. On her own, for the first time in her life, the young dancer was intoxicated with a sense of freedom and independence. Taking both her family and her fiance by surprise, Julie impetuously cashed in her paycheck and headed for New York City. Instead of staying in Los Angeles and getting married to Louis L'Amour, as was planned, um, she ran away in the spring of 54 to New York. Big scandal in the family. Perhaps she wanted to actualize her career much more than she could have as a young wife. But she had had the courage to jump with both feet into a, a new career, a new city, a new life. She was discovering that there was a heck of a lot more to her than a serious dancer, that uh, she had more to offer than that. Her parents were frantic and begged their daughter to come home. But for Julie Newmeyer, there was no going back. Her strike for freedom was only the first step toward making her own dreams come true. In 1954, 21-year-old Julie Newmeyer landed in Manhattan and immediately felt at ease in both New York's sophisticated and bohemian circles. She hit the pavement looking for work as a dancer on Broadway, but she quickly discovered there was no room in the chorus for a dazzling enchantress who stood six foot two in heels. Realizing that her figure could be her fortune, she began earning extra money as a model for the covers of record albums and dime store publications. Julie's luck suddenly changed. Streamlining her name, Julie Newmeyer became Julie Newmar, and on February 25, 1955, she made her Broadway debut in the Cole Porter musical, Silk Stockings. That was just uh, as she left Los Angeles when she ran away from home. Um, the transformation was also a rebirth in, under a new name. New, new town, new job, new life, new name. Newmar's career was beginning to take off. Although she had promised to become Mrs. Louis L'Amour, she decided she wasn't ready for marriage and returned the ring to her stunned fiance. In 1956, Julie's remarkable height and curves finally worked in her favor and won her the role of stupefying Jones in the Broadway production of Lil Abner. She had no speaking lines, but the press labeled Julie's number 90 Seconds of Wonder. 
Two years later, when Paramount Pictures was bringing the sold-out show to the screen, the producers knew there was only one woman in the world who could step into Julie Newmar's shoes. Stupefying Joan. I saw this movie and Julie Newmar popped out of a rocket ship dressed in almost nothing and zapped Jerry Lewis with her hips and I was like, oh, wow. What does it do? It's a deadly weapon. Guaranteed to stupefy any human male dead in his tracks. Here, I'll demonstrate. Hey, it's you, McRabbit. Yeah? Come on over here. All right, honey. Five, four, three, two, blast off. Stupefy. The film brought the popular comic strip to life in musical numbers and glorious Technicolor. Lil Abner was an unqualified hit, and reviewers fell all over their vocabularies looking for clever ways to describe Dog Patch's most luscious resident. All she did was stand there and be bombastic and have people worship her and uh, look at her like she was something from another planet. They couldn't believe it. Of course, she was a Medusa in reverse. She was turning people into stone because she was beautiful. Well, when you look like Julie Newmar, my God, things do happen. You know, you don't have to kind of do anything but smile and crook your finger, and it'll come your way. Julie didn't even have to crook her finger to land her first starring role, playing an actress willing to do anything for publicity in the military comedy, The Rookie. You asked me to marry you, and I said yes. Well, don't you remember? I asked you to... You said yes. But I wouldn't have said yes for publicity. I remember I wanted to ask you. Uh... You did. Well, if you don't remember, it couldn't have meant very much. Well, it's, it, it's just that I... That I... That I... You uh... don't feel the same way. Well, I do. <laughs> Leave everything to me. I'll be, I'll, I'll be right back. Tony, I love you. And I love you. That was beautiful. You really got me. I, I never saw that side before. Except that last I love you. That was a little corny. <laughs> corny? How dare you? I'd like to see Betty Davis do it any better. Although Julie's jaw-dropping sex appeal couldn't save the rookie from box office failure, Broadway producers were waiting in the wings with a tailor-made role. They cast the 25-year-old opposite acting legends Charles Boyer and Claudette Colbert in The Marriage Go-Round as a Swedish house guest intent on seducing her married host. You read uh, Earl Wilson's column, the other columnists of the day. Everybody was talking about how in this one scene in Marriage Go-Round, uh, blonde bombshell Julie goes out to take a sunbath and comes back only wearing a towel with nothing underneath. This was big news <laughs> at the time. Theater goers watched eagle-eyed, hoping for Newmar to accidentally shed her towel. But Julie managed to keep herself covered, and her performance was so impressive that she went home with that year's Tony Award for Best Supporting Actress. Hollywood was also keeping an eye on the Broadway star, and in 1960, 20th Century Fox put Julie under contract. She was now working alongside such blonde sex symbols as Marilyn Monroe, Sherry North, and Jane Mansfield. Newmar's first assignment was to reprise her role in the film version of The Marriage Go-Round, starring Susan Hayward and James Mason. Now, I try to be a good hostess. I offered you liquor, cigarettes, the run of the house. I did not offer you the head of the house. Until I hear from him that he is off limits, I intend to proceed as scheduled. You do. Mrs. Davy, for your own sake, I ask you to think carefully. I'm younger, prettier, stronger, bigger, and more intelligent than you. Don't fight it. But moviegoers knew that Julie would never drop her towel, and in the translation from stage to screen, the marriage go-round lost its sizzle. Disappointed, the actress realized that luck and long legs would only get her so far. 
Deciding to learn more about her craft, she returned to New York and auditioned for Lee Strasberg at the Actors Studio. Newmar was immediately accepted, along with another blonde determined to be taken seriously, Marilyn Monroe. One of the differences between Julie and uh, Monroe or Mansfield was that she was well grounded in her religious beliefs. She was well grounded intellectually. She knew herself with a little bit more confidence perhaps th than they did. Her brain was working just a little faster and on a slightly higher level than the rest of us little twits. And uh, so I think that maybe has a great deal to do with the fact that she didn't get caught up with booze or drugs or running with the strange people. Live theater continued to offer Julie more diverse roles, and she went on the road playing the lead in such hit musicals as Guys and Dolls and Irma La Douce. All the hit shows in the 50s and 60s, they always had a road company, so the, the road was a big, big business. You would go to a different city maybe every other week, or sometimes uh, every two weeks, and um, it was highly demanding, but thrilling. But Julie's efforts to make her stage work lead to more meaningful parts on the screen didn't pay off. I think she was typecast because producers were intimidated by her. Here is somebody who is smarter than they are, who is taller than they are, certainly prettier than they are, and they didn't know what to do with her. By 1960, the era of the sex siren was coming to a close and 20th Century Fox was at a loss as to what to do with Julie Newmar. Over the next several years, the actress was limited to guest spots on popular television shows such as The Beverly Hillbillies and Adventures in Paradise. Come to the party, chum. It's time you were thinking of Captain Adam Troy. Right now, I'm only interested in what's happening to those people out there. Let me spell it out for you. You better get off this island before they kill you. Switching sides? <laughs> I wouldn't mind being partners with you, Adam. Just you and me. While Newmar prepared for another television appearance in March 1962, she received the news that her 27-year-old brother, Peter, was missing. Julie was inconsolable as rescuers searched for three harrowing days combing the area around Snow Valley. He skied into a blind canyon during uh, the beginnings of a snowstorm, and he couldn't get out of the canyon. The snowstorm worsened, and he uh, basically died of exposure. Grief-stricken by the death of her younger brother, Julie now devoted all of her time to her family. At the age of 29, her career seemed to have peaked, but the next decade would offer Julie Newmar opportunities that would catapult her from being a starlet to a star. By 1963, Julie Newmar was not yet a household name, but she was keeping her face and her figure in the public eye. I'm Mother Nature, and these are my boys. The 30-year-old had been pursued by more than one Kennedy, a veritable Fortune 500 of financiers and a number of Hollywood's hottest leading men. But Julie was not yet ready to give up on her career, and neither was 20th Century Fox. Hey, Chris, guess what Taffy... Not now, honey. I've been doing a dude ranch layout all afternoon, and I'm late, late, late. Taffy, mix Perry a drink while Andy helps me change into a girl. That year, the studio produced the TV pilot Three on an Island, a thinly veiled reworking of the Marilyn Monroe hit How to Marry a Millionaire. Oh, see you next week. Don't forget, it's a date. Unfortunately, the show was not picked up, and Julie remained anxious to prove that she was more than just a pretty face. She got her chance when she was cast as four different women in the road company production of Stop the World, I Want to Get Off, also starring Joel Grey. The Labner and Marriage Go Round were sort of big, dumb, gorgeous girls, whereas uh, the part of Evie in Stop the World uh, took a tre tremendous amount of uh, intelligence and complicated thinking and uh, characterization that I think 
she probably wasn't expected to do as well as she did. So I think she surprised a lot of people. In 1964, she accepted the role of a voluptuous robot named Rhoda, opposite Robert Cummings as the Air Force psychiatrist assigned to program her with a personality. I've just got to get you some clothes. I'm gonna make a call right now. This, this blanket of yours has got to go. Very well. No, no, no. Not now. No, not now. Boy, I've got to be careful what I tell you, don't I? Tell me anything you like. If it's picked up on my computers, I respond immediately. Yeah, that's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> but My Living Doll was taken off the air after only one season. My memory bank has been fed with over 50 million items of information which I can compute in less than one second. This is a recording. <laughs> was on opposite Bonanza, which was the number one show, and uh, it lasted a full year, mostly on the strength of just watching Julie Newmar. So My Living Doll was by no means a bomb. It was uh, a respectable run for a very silly premise. Clearly, Julie Newmar was now a television name. In 1966, she joined Adam West, Burt Ward, and an elite list of Hollywood stars clamoring to appear as guest villains on the popular Batman series. The Catwoman is not like the others. I'll show you how to clip Batman and Robin's wings. I will prevail. We were looking for a beautiful woman with a sensuous form and yet with a sense of power and somebody with a believable feline type of movement uh, uh, and somebody who could act. But Julie wasn't at all sure that she wanted to return to TV as a cat burglar in high heels. She called me up and asked me about Batman and it was I that said, oh, Julie, Batman, this is, this is camp. Robin, you haven't fastened your safety bat belt. Remember, motor is safety. And camp is just the thing. So uh, that was the kind of enthusiasm that I think helped get her to commit to that role. Is that so? Tell me more. When she first came in with that black feline suit painted on her, you know, you, she was absolutely uh, everything that I envisioned a Catwoman should be on the show. And her body, not that I'm an expert on Julie's body, for example, but uh, it defied physics. You got some uh, class, baby. Oh, my God. Ga, ga, ga. Wow. When I throw that switch, the noise will become excruciating. Shortly following that, your brains will be turned into yeah. And then you can be mine forever, Batman. True, I'll have to sacrifice your intellect. Oh, well. With a built like yours, who cares? After all, one can't have one's cake and uh, eat it too. Catwoman was Batman's femme fatale. Perfect. 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 And Numar's overt sensuality added a new twist to their relationship. I'll do everything I can to rehabilitate you. Marry me. Everything except that. She says, oh, Batman, we could be so happy together. And Batman says, what about Robin? Robin? Oh, I've got it. We'll kill him. It was a dichotomy. It was a, a tug always, you know. Gosh, what do I do? Do I strangle her, put her in jail, get, get rid of this denizen of Gotham, or do I embrace her and take her to Wayne Manor and have my way with her? It, you know, it was uh, really kind of strange and silly. After only three episodes, Julie had become primetime TV's reigning sex kitten. She realized that it was such a strong presence for a woman in the mid-60s on television to play a domineering vixen that she really embraced the notoriety that came with it. Within months of the series debut, the show's producers decided to capitalize on the success of their small screen phenomenon. 
by producing Batman the feature film. But noticeably absent from the cast was Julie Newmar. Batman's feline nemesis was played instead by Lee Merriweather. Perfect. Newmar had declined to slip back into her cat suit. That year, she donned moccasins instead and starred with Gregory Peck and Omar Sharif in the big budget Western, McKenna's Gold. We can promise you this. If you have a taste for high adventure, if you were thrilled by the guns of Navarro, then McKenna's Gold is the film you've been waiting to see. Despite its high-powered cast, McKenna's Gold slumped at the box office. And although Julie did return for a second season of Batman, she called it quits the next year, leaving Eartha Kitt to play the role. Julie's uh, motivations are not grounded in fame or fortune. I've seen her turn down a lot of different things because she wasn't uh, in the mood, you know, whether it was a psychic mood or a professional mood or an artistic mood. In 1969, Julie had weightier issues on her mind. As the United States became more involved in the bloody conflict in Vietnam, the actress became increasingly outraged by the staggering loss of life. Newmar attended rallies and used her celebrity to influence students at local universities. She became very radical in the late 60s, as we all did. And uh, so she was quite active, quite fierce in the anti-war effort. Julie also began evaluating what was missing in her own life. Although she had never found the man who could meet her high expectations, she still had dreams of being a mother. She'd been talking about having a child for a long time. In fact, I remember her saying, John, I wish I had the courage to have an illegitimate child. What a statement. In her professional life, the 36-year-old performer had found success by simply accepting what fate had to offer. But in her personal life, it was becoming clear that to get what she wanted, Julie Newmar would have to take control. McLeod, you are a trip. This is New York. It's not Dodge City. Throughout the early 1970s, Julie Newmar continued to accept occasional guest appearances on such television shows as McCloud and The Bionic Woman. At an age when many actresses were being relegated to character roles, 40-year-old Newmar was still being cast as the elusive object of desire. Aware that her youthful appearance and well-toned body were still her stock in trade, Julie continued rigorous dance classes three times a week. In 1975, she received a call from John Holt Smith, an attorney she had met at a Los Angeles art exhibition two years earlier. The screen siren immediately hit it off with a charismatic 35-year-old. He's a striking figure, physically confident, with a Texan quality of extroversion and, and ease and strength. On August 5, 1977, Julie and Holt were married. She's always gone by her feeling, you know, and uh, at that point in her life, I think she felt getting married was right because it was someone she loved and someone she thought she could make her life with. But Newmar shocked friends and family by abandoning a 25-year career and moving to Fort Worth to be with her husband. This was more important than her career. I mean, she just loved the idea of being a wife. Although Julie was making a home in Texas, Holt convinced his wife that her contacts in Los Angeles could bolster his law practice. In 1980, the couple returned to the West Coast, ready to start a family. She wanted children very badly, and she had one miscarriage, I think. Um, and then she... Uh, became pregnant again and um, had amniocentesis. After miscarrying a second time, Julie became pregnant once again. Still in top physical condition, she took every precaution, spending most of her time at home, writing, resting, and meditating. In February 1981, Julie gave birth to a son, John Jewell Smith. Despite her prudence, there were complications. 
the infant was diagnosed with Down's syndrome. But Julie refused to accept the news as a tragedy. She, almost without a pause, was ready to be John's mom. There was no problem. She would handle whatever came up in the way of challenges, and that's her strength. That's why people do say John is the great love of her life, period. Julie's husband, however, had more difficulty adjusting to his son's disability, and the additional stress began to cause problems in their relationship. Six months later, Holt and Julie separated and eventually divorced. Personally, I think John's handicap was a big factor. Might have been money problems, she might have been saddled with some of his debts and, you know, whatever it was. But I, I think uh, John's birth was probably a major factor on his part. Now a single mother with mounting bills, Julie took almost any part that was offered, including a role in nudity required. Irina Sabachka, head of Soviet Union's arms verification delegation. We are here for the next three months to inspect American missiles. We have uh, all arrangements and paid. This is rental lease. If you do not honor it, I will sue your asses off. By 1983, Julie's life seemed to be back on stable ground, but two-year-old John's was not. Already suffering from congenital health problems, the toddler came down with meningitis and lost his hearing. She is adamant that he is capable of living and enjoying a life that has fulfillment and happiness and a lot of things that you wouldn't imagine are possible for a kid who is really handicapped. Julie wanted to spend her time taking care of John, but her life as a performer often meant weeks on location away from home. In 1984, Julie saw a solution to her problem when she inherited commercial real estate from her mother. The 50-year-old enrolled at UCLA Night School to learn how to manage the properties and make a living while working from her house. I remember years and years and years ago, she would have a, like a panic attack if she even had to go to a bank. You know, she had no not really any business acumen. And here she was having to make a living now at this. Although she had lived in the limelight since the age of 19, Julie Newmar was certain that the most challenging and creative years of her life lay ahead. Ah. By 1989, Batmania was once again sweeping the country. Warner Brothers' updated feature film was a hit, and Julie Newmar was part of the campaign to bring the 1960s series back into the public eye. Well, what do you have, Catwoman? Mm. Yeah. Now 60, Julie decided it was time to have a little fun with her career and her pop culture status. For three successive years, Julie strutted her stuff on the catwalk with such supermodels as Jerry Hall, Claudia Schiffer, and Linda Evangelista. She's the Mugler archetype. She's the tall glamazon with the waistline who can go out there and give glamour and sell it. I like the strength and the dynamite and the shape of the body. And I must say the, the bombshell aspect so, uh, must amaze me the most, yeah. When Moogler was set to direct George Michael's new video, Too Funky, he introduced Julie to the MTV generation. She's a unique human being, and she's a good boy. She's a soldier. She's, she's a really uh, hard worker, and she does, does the shit, the oops, <laughs> you know, the job. By 1995, Julie Newmar was firmly back in the public eye and no one was happier than her legions of fans. I staged a contingent of the Gay and Lesbian Freedom Day Parade called the Lesbian and Gay Cat Lovers of America, uh, celebrating uh, the love of cats with Catwoman as our, as our uh, star. 
Of course, she's in show business and she's been around gay people all of her life and she's been around drag performers all of her life, so that's really not a big deal for her to be idolized. That same year, Julie received the ultimate accolade when a movie was written about her unique persona. To Wong Fu, Thanks for Everything, Julie Newmar, starred John Leguizamo, Wesley Snipes, and Patrick Swayze as drag queens on a road trip from New York to Hollywood. The highlight of the film was a cameo appearance by Julie Newmar herself. She's the ideal feminine idea, the ideal woman, and that's what these men are aspiring to look like and be. By the year 2000, Julie's life with her son John was as stable and rewarding as anything she had ever known. This is a transformative experience for her to have had uh, that child. She's become since then notably more centered and calm, not in a rush about things, uh, more focused. This is the prehistoric garden here. The children love this place. There are all kinds of animals hidden everywhere. She had created a magical and secure environment for her son. Julie doesn't have hobbies, she has passions, okay? And the first passion, of course, is John. The second one is gardens and gardening. That's a passion. A hobby, again, connotes something that you dabble in. Julie doesn't dabble in anything. We do a lot of sit-ups because, right, John? Right, John? We don't want an ice cream belly. Julie's a very commanding presence in her neighborhood. When she goes for a walk or rides her bicycle, she always has a willowy skirt or a flowery hat. And it's very much kind of a cool combination of Mary Poppins and and Margaret. For almost five decades, audiences have known her as a captivating bombshell on the stage, screen, television, and catwalk. But it is Julie Newmar's private life and personal triumphs that show her to be one of the true beauties of our time. You actually believe you are irresistible, don't you? Do you actually believe I'm not? Julie is a miracle. She has, at her age, a freshness and an enthusiasm about life. She's completely timeless. I don't think a career was what Julie was about. I think she was about experiencing life, whether it was dancing, acting, or going out and uh, parachuting from a plane. She would do anything that was uh, interesting, that was being alive. If I could stand to wear shoes, I'd own Australia. She's kind of out there, floating a little bit, and yet she's gutty and kind of with it. To me, Julie is Misty Lavender, a flowering wild orchid, and the sound of cats purring. Perfect. That's Julie Newmar. Until we meet again, here's a kiss to build a dream on.